Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to collinslaststand.com. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 125. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Chris, stuck at 30 frames Raygun. Chris, thank you for joining me today. Of course, as always. How are you? I'm good. You know, I'm How's feeling, California? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's weirdly warm. You mm. know, I'm still... Uh, I, I actually like... The weather in LA in particular is so inconsistent year to year that I, I can never really get used to it. Like when I moved here f- the first year that I was here, it was sweltering throughout winter. And then the next year it was kind of chilly and you could like wear your jacket and it made sense. And now it's like one of those things where it's like freezing at night and sweltering in the, in the daytime. So I, I, re- I really have no idea how to, how to go about this place. Are you, how are you feeling? I mean, do you long for New York now that you've not been there for a little while or? Uh, or what? the cold helps me from longing, mm. <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm excited, you know, just to get back there in general for sure. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited to have you back as well. I just, just feel like you're closer to me when you're there. You are literally closer to me, but also you feel closer to me. Yeah. Now, Chris, Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. We put it up each and every week. You can get it three days early and ad free by supporting us on Patreon. Like nearly 10,000 of you do uh, at patreon.com slash Collins last stand. We need to get the numbers back up a little bit. Yeah. The numbers are, are starting to fall. Now, there's a level of attrition. We're technically up month over month with numbers. I think we're like plus 30 or something like that. But there's a level of attrition on Patreon because people's credit cards change and stuff. And then people just kind of eke out. And those numbers aren't really counted as being lost in our in our data. And the, the more people you have on Patreon, the more that problem exists. So come join us if you can. If not, support us on free feeds. Listen to the ads. Support the advertisers if you want. Yeah, I mean, that would be nice. No, you don't be, have to. Yeah, that would be that would be kind of good, I think. Yeah, you don't have to do that, though. But we are glad to have you here. Now, this weekly PlayStation podcast that we do is typically about PS4, PS Vita and PS VR. But of course, it's recently been about PS5 as well. And Chris, we're very glad to welcome our European listeners and others that have finally gotten on board as of the time this podcast goes live for everyone. So welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Europe. <laughs> Finally, uh, et cetera. And of course, our kindest regards goes out to those or go our kindest regards go out, I should say, to the people that are looking for consoles and can't find one. I know it's it's bad out there. We have gotten, Chris, a few complaints. This came up on Plus, I think, last week mm-hmm. that people are like some people are mad. We've even lost patrons because people are mad at us for talking about PS5 when they don't have one. That That's actually a thing that literally happened. Wow. So, I mean, what do we what was the expectation exactly? I don't know. I don't know what else we're supposed to do. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't have to talk about PlayStation 5, but I feel like it's the most appropriate thing to do considering it's out and we're all quite excited about it. Well, and, and you know, it's a, you know, a PlayStation podcast. Mm. I feel like that's kind of uh, kind of part of it. <laughs> I think yes. you would assume. Yes, I would agree. I would agree with you there. But welcome one. Welcome all to our show. I did bring up Sacred Symbols Plus, of course, which is our supplemental podcast only for patrons. We do each and every week. We go an hour, hour and a half, two hours, sometimes even longer about random topics. The last one was very well received. It was actually Chris, Dustin and I. We all did an episode called Shiny New Toy, where we solicited more of your inquiries. We like to let our audience in on the show, as everyone knows that listens. And so it was really just a episode driven by your inquiries and your thoughts and your experiences with PS5 so far. I had a lot of fun doing it. The next episode of Plus Chris will actually include neither of us. What we're going to do is have, I think, Dustin and Mr. Matty plays drive for a little while and talk about the differences in their experience between PS5 and Xbox Series X since they both own and play those consoles. Um, I actually have an X1, Xbox One or what is it? X, Xbox Series X in my house. Um, my girlfriend Micah brought it with her so she can play. She's a huge Xbox fan, but I have not actually played with it yet. I held the controller. 
And yeah. It's very nice, but but I have no inquiry. And you bought one, but it didn't come or something, right? It, something yeah, happened. It, it, Amazon j- still just says order received. So like, that's good. Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> that's useful. Yeah, at least you got one of them, right? So. Yeah. The, the, my my hope was that I would at least get one of these things, and you know, you, at the very least, I got the PlayStation one, so I could I could continue to do this. Yeah. So we wouldn't have any problems with the show. Although I wouldn't. It wouldn't be a huge deal. We would, it, it, we would make it work. Yeah, but it would have been work. awkward for like a little bit at least. For sure, yeah, you'd be playing Miles Morales and Sackboy and all that stuff on PS4, which is fine. Some people are playing it on PS4 on accident. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we have that uh, going on as well. Let's see, is there anything else to talk about? No, other than just support us on Patreon if you can. Leave us nice reviews on free feeds. We appreciate your love, kindness, and support of our show. I yeah. feel real laid back today. I don't know. I just feel, I feel um, I'm ready for the weekend, you know? Yeah, it's a lax, it's a lax kind of day, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, now that now yeah. that now that we all kind of expect that uh, no holidays will happen, suddenly the holidays are looking, you know, really chill. <laughs> in a, in yeah. A, what, in a, what, are, what do we expect, really? You know, what are you going to do, by the way? Are, are you going to be able to get out of California? It's uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> the, the plans might have to be a little bit altered, but mm. uh, that's, you know, that's definitely a, a wrench in the gears, as one would say. Sure. Yeah, I hear you there. All right, let's see what's going on here in the world of PlayStation. The first one I want to read here is from Brent Linquist, who wrote in something very nice. He said, hey, fellas, I just wanted to compliment you on how entertaining the show has remained for those of us who may not own a PS5 for another year or two. I wasn't worried, but it's certainly nice to find myself getting the same amount of enjoyment out of the show as I did prior to the PS5's launch. Great work and thanks for the show. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate that. We're getting a little bit of the other side of this. And hey, but it doesn't seem like we're going to talk about this a little in a little while. PlayStation 5 doesn't really have that many exclusives that we know about. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so it's not like you're going to be totally out if you have a PS4. This is not a PSP podcast or anything like that where we're really not talking to anyone. So <laughs> still plenty of you out there. We're going to talk about this concern in a little while. It's in the news. Yeah. But thank you, Brent, for writing in. Appreciate that. And Rob Kavazny wrote into us and there's a K and a V next to in his name. I don't understand exactly how that works, but. He says, to whom it may concern, now that PS5 is here, I need something else to look forward to. Many games on the horizon, pun intended, are without release dates, and the holidays are canceled. So I turn my attention to you, Jensen, and ask, when can we anticipate the announcement of more CLS programs? How many days a week will we be blessed with new podcasts? How many podcasts? Any new Patreon perks? Patreon perks? The people want answers. The answer to all of that is yes, in some way. Mm -hmm. We will be talking in January about a... We're going to welcome in a couple of more people into the fold, into our Collins Last Stand family. We're going to be introducing another show. Chris and I won't be, but someone else will be. And there will be, I think, maybe new perks, but more stretch goals on Patreon. One of the stretch goals we're playing with is doing a second episode of Sacred Symbols Plus every week, which I don't think you guys deserve, to be perfectly honest with you. But (laughs) nonetheless, we might give it to you anyway. (laughs) That's so fucking, that's so blunt. (laughs) <laughs> i mean what do you guys do you don't deserve another yeah episode another two hours of this a week come on i don't uh, know if you can handle it no too much just a few technical notes chris i don't know if you saw any of this ps5 got its first firmware update this must have been updated when uh, i didn't do it manually so this must have just happened did you notice this yeah no i i saw it uh i i think uh, i turned it on and i saw it happening so like i was like oh okay cool neat i wonder what that is well, it doesn't seem to have fixed any of my problems. I, I still I ran into a new problem yesterday. So I downloaded I, 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 I think I discussed this on plus. Maybe I can't remember. This is the problem with doing too many podcasts, talking too much. Uh, but I had a problem with Netflix on my PS5 where it wouldn't play the office, the American office. It just wouldn't play it like wouldn't play the audio from it. And then I had to go into the audio settings and set it to like Dolby surround sound or something. Then it worked. So then I went on Hulu. I hadn't had any other problems. This, by the way, that problem was mimicked in Miles Morales on PS5, as I discussed, where Miles' voice track just wasn't in the game. Everything else was. So really weird audio problems. But then I had no issues after making that random change, even though, to, much to everyone's chagrin, I use my TV speakers. All right. So I go and I download Hulu. I'm a Hulu member, but I just hadn't downloaded it yet. Log in. And I wanted to go watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, of course, mm-hmm. as one does. Yeah. And I put on the episode. What episode was it? It was... um. Oh, Dennis Reynolds and erotic life or whatever. <laughs> and the and the audio wouldn't come through again. So now it's on the Dolby setting. So then I go to like the DTS setting and then I go back to like the regular TV setting. Nothing works. So I just can't get Hulu to play 
this random show. So there's just, in other words, I assume the firmware updates that we're going to be receiving are ironing out these many issues. And I had heard that even some of these big media partners really didn't have PS5 dev kits until very late. So a lot of this stuff just isn't working properly. And so my assumption is that we'll get fixes on that. Have you experienced any weird UX issues like that? Um, no, like I haven't had any audio issues. Um, I, I know Spider-Man Miles Morales like has a couple like, has a couple audio issues like that. Like, I, I haven't experienced them, but I've seen other people. That, that game's also like has like a, a really weird amount of bugs it's not like super it's not like fallout level buggy but like i've seen i saw this video uh, on, on twitter the other day of somebody playing it and then spider-man becomes a block of snow and then he becomes <laughs> like a rack of t-shirts it's it's why and he just continues to like anamorph between these different like things and it's like real. it's really funny but uh i you know i bugs like this are probably pretty common whenever there's like new hardware and new software but no, I haven't had I haven't had the audio thing happen. Nothing like that. Yeah, it's been annoying. I mean, it's it's limited, but it, it was annoying because I, as I said, as I described, I was really into like excited to play Miles Morales that first night and it kind of ruined my experience. But I've gone back to the game. We'll talk about it in a little while. It's obviously very good. The other technical note I wanted to talk about real quick, and this is something you might have noticed because you do play games on PC, is that DualSense now works for Steam games, but it doesn't work haptically. If that right. Makes any yeah. Sense. So you can play it with the inputs that's about it that's good though that's good it's yeah. it's it's nice because like i i never really wanted to uh use my dualshock 4 on pc ever it was it was pretty much always like yeah i'll go to the xbox elite series controller or whatever the hell and i would use that as like my default pc controller but like you know dual sense is pretty damn good you know i i definitely will be messing around with that on on pc for sure i like it a lot too so yeah, just uh, if any of the PC nerds out there wanted to know, yeah, plug in your dual sense. You can do that. And as Chris already said, the Xbox controller is better known for this. Going back to the Xbox 360, I always got excited to just plug that in to play PC games. That itself was a game changer because you didn't have to use all these third party garbage controllers that for some reason, no one can make a good controller unless it's like the manufacturers of the hardware. For some reason, <laughs> it's, there's just yeah, it's so weird. Those Mad Cats controllers that would just like shatter within like three months. What happened? Did Mad Mad Cats, they're still around. They're quick. still around. I looked this up recently. Yeah, because they are they invested. Yeah, they went bankrupt. I remember this. They went bankrupt because they I think went. didn't they go all in on some music shit? They published rock band stuff, but then I think they were the publisher of like one of the new rock band or guitar hero games. And I think that destroyed the company. It's very similar to what happened to the original THQ with, of course, the game you draw. <laughs> Who could forget that? Remember that? You yeah. draw is the reason THQ went out of business. Damn. So they made people should go look up you draw, but it was like this tablet. You hooked it up to PS3, 360, and Wii. And it was like you drew on, you, I don't know what you did with it, but they just over manufactured the shit out of this and they just had this glut of stuff and they couldn't afford it. And they went out of business. That's what happened. So let's see here. Oh, Joey Beal wrote in kind of similar. He says, Hey, Colin. He says cheese, like C H I apostrophe S. Huh. I don't know what that means. Typo, probably. I don't. You think so? I it mean, seems very intentional. C H I apostrophe S. Chiss. Chiss. Yeah. All right. And Dust, Dustin's on here. Well, let's not fill Dustin's head with or delusions of grandeur. He says, in all this excitement for the PS5, I'm wondering if Twin Breaker can get any of the sweet haptic goodness with a PS5 version. I downloaded it again, but would love to triple up on some platinum PS5 acting too, if possible. PS. I love Astro's Playroom and would never have bought it if it wasn't included. Now I might get Sackboy. I'd like to get Sackboy as well. Now. We don't have a PS5 dev kit. That's not a huge surprise. I've been thinking about this, though, Chris, about could we uh, uh, release some sort of free update for Twin Breaker or some sort of small paid DLC? I don't know. New stages, whatever. Or a special edition where we could put some of the haptics in there, because I actually think our game would work pretty well with the haptic controller. And I was thinking a lot about that. I think that you could do. And by you, I mean, Barry uh, (laughs) can can make this happen. So it's in my mind. Yeah, no, I, I think it would work for really well, but like obviously, like you said, there's no dev kit present. So like, how would you even? I, I'm I'm no dev, so I, I wouldn't even know the first thing about like how to program vibration in a controller. And uh, honestly, even for experienced devs, I feel like that's kind of a bitch to be like, hey, let's do HD rumble. And it's like, uh, maybe not. Maybe 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 yeah, not. Yeah, <laughs> sure. No, I I um I don't know how it works either, and uh, it's my game, so. 
<laughs> Nonetheless, we're thinking about that. Hey, I wanted to let everyone know, too. Cyberpunk 2077 on PS4 will come on two discs. Just in case anyone was curious. Yeah, that's pretty. That that's uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 also. Wow, nice. This dude's uh, mad maxing across the street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 is also two discs, right? Was Final Fantasy 7 remake two discs or was that not? I think it might have been as well. I have all of those games digitally, so I don't know. But I do remember Red Dead was two discs. I do remember that. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I just wanted to let everyone know that. It shouldn't affect the price of the game, but people might be curious about that. Let's see here. Oh, Sam Jackson wrote in. Maybe it is the Sam Jackson. Oh, it probably is. He says, hey, CNC, greetings from New Zealand. Have you seen that people have been receiving the disc version of the PS5 in the digital version boxes? Essentially getting an upgrade for free. Do you know anyone this has happened to? I unfortunately got exactly what I ordered in the digital version. Why would they do this to me? I was seeing this. Have you seen this at all? Obviously, the, the discless version comes in this different box, but when they it's like a black box. But when they open the co- the box, apparently there's like a disc version in it. I don't know how often this has happened, but and it could be a, a I don't know. It could be a trick, but I don't know why that would. Why would you do that? Yeah, Have I, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any of this. This is the first time I'm hearing about any of this, but. The um, that would be pretty wild if you, if you just got if you just got an upgrade like that for like just by a complete. What, what, how would that be like a boxing error? Because it wouldn't be like manufacturing, obviously, because they just they made the thing correctly. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a boxing error. I mean, what came to mind when I saw some of this stuff floating around, assuming it's not some sort of hoax. I don't again, it's kind of a stupid hoax, but is that and I had known this I know this from a source of mine and I had said this a few weeks ago that Sony is substantially under manufacturing the discless versions of the PS5 to something like 10 to 1 so they want to sell the more expensive version that's not a huge surprise there's more of a margin there for them to make money the the disc drive is not $100 they're charging $100 more so they're just making more money by selling uh, the disc version my assumption might be here is that it could be an error, obviously. I mean, it could be an, an, an but these things are coming off the, the lines differently and stuff. So my assumption might be that, like, maybe they couldn't fulfill like a very specific, let's say, pallet order of thousands of consoles at Foxconn or something. And so they literally just put the disc versions in the discless boxes because they had no other stock. And then maybe the assumption is no one's really going to care. Maybe they'd care in the other direction. They definitely would care in the other direction. If you got the discless version in the disc box. So maybe it's just that, you know, maybe it was just them making up for some lost time or some lost product on the production side. No one was the wiser. And that's how it happened. But that's just an assumption. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. That's that's such a weird era. I don't think I've ever seen that ever happen because I don't know how else it would really go. The The whole configuration of the of the lines in the factories when you're making these consoles have to be totally different. One is totally different than the other. You know, they're not just like coming yeah. off the line together. You know, how many how often is it? Is this like a lot of like videos that uh, that show this happening? I only saw a couple of images of it, but mm-hmm. um, so but my, I don't know. My gut is my gut is telling me that like it's like a joke. Like for no it, reason. It could be. Yeah, it could be. It, it would it would be weird. I mean, it's not unprecedented to get the wrong thing in the wrong box. But yeah, I, I just don't I can't track it back to its source, knowing what I know about production, unless it was done intentionally yeah. to just fulfill some order. And 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 again, you could connect the dots, assuming this is real. Again, Chris might be right. It might be a hoax, uh, but just interesting to talk about from uh, from our friend Sam Jackson, who wrote into us. He's in New Zealand for some reason, but uh, <laughs> he has enough money to travel wherever he wants. And he was looking for a digital ps5 but yeah the digital ps5s i would be i wouldn't be surprised if you don't even if there are no digital ps5s after a while and they get rid of them yeah but we'll see what happens oh all right so i wanted to bring this up real quick last week chris we discussed how we discussed game prices and we discussed rumors from bloomberg saying that sony was internally had internally discussed raising the prices of their first party games even higher than 70 dollars. they settled on 70 dollars. everyone else did as well and um jim ryan who's the ceo of playstation in an, in a recent interview which we're going to talk about later in a different context did say quote that we were considering higher prices for first party games is categorically categorically false end quote so i just wanted to let everyone know that little update and you know what's interesting about this someone had pointed this out this is not a unique column thought i wouldn't have realized this this is the second time in a few weeks that bloomberg has totally denied sony's or sony has denied reporting from bloomberg specifically and someone held out someone had brought up a different um let me just see if i can find to make sure i'm not speaking out of turn here 
um, what the other story was. So the second time that the Bloomberg had reported something recently, and this was back in September, they had reported that they were making remember they were making millions of fewer PS5s than they had anticipated they were going to be able to make. Hence the supply constraint. Yeah. Sony Sony denied that Bloomberg report. And then Sony denies this new Bloomberg report. I think there's beef generating between Bloomberg and Sony. And it's something uh, worth keeping an eye on because Sony usually this reminds me a little bit of Sony's old relationship with Kotaku, which people might remember where Sony wouldn't say anything about anything, but then would like come out and like deny Sony Kotaku's reporting about stuff. And that all went back to PlayStation Home and and Kotaku revealing PlayStation Home early. It's a weird story. People might remember that, but that's kind of the most reminiscent thing. And uh, I just wanted to point out that Jim Ryan, to his credit, is denying that reporting that we talked about last week. That's pretty insane. That, the, yeah. that this that's like the second time I wonder I don't know that seems like such a weird thing to deny though because like you'd assume like when you're making a next generation product of any kind or when you're like at least brainstorming this thing surely someone has to be considering raising the prices you know what I mean like that's sh- that surely has to be at least a thought that comes across at least once even if it's like not really like a, a you know a, a consideration that is brought into like a serious discussion you know what I mean? It, 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 I, I feel like we talk about like a lot of these on the podcast where it's like, you know, oh, hey, you know, Microsoft is considering bringing the the Master Chief collection to PS4. It's like I'm sure that was like a consideration in some way, even if it wasn't like some high level like consideration that had like contracts drawn up or anything like that. In, in addition to that, it's just interesting from the sense of. Well, companies lie all the time. Yeah. Right? yeah. And and. It reminds me, I know I've brought this up in the past, but it reminds me of Microsoft itself even denying reporting that I had made. And they actually denied it more recently, although I made the report years ago that they were considering bringing the Master Chief Collection to PS4, which we're actually going to talk about something similar in a little while in the news as well. And they said, you know, some guy there was tweeting saying like, oh, those conversations never happened. Or, But then it ended up being that like he wasn't privy to them. And well, we talk about all sorts of stuff and, you know, and I'm like, well, it did happen. I tr- completely trust the source. And to your point, of course, they talked about making more money on the games. I mean, you would assume that they said, how much can we charge for these games? And then they got a b- bunch of reporting back from their analysts. And, yeah. And they settled on $70. I'm sh- they'd be stupid not to discuss $80. And it's interesting because Robbie Bra wrote into us on Patreon about this. And remember, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins last stand to submit your inquiries as well. He says this question is for Colin. Over the years, we've heard you speak numerous times about how the rising price of games isn't something to be alarmed about and how after adjusting for inflation, it's actually, in fact, cheaper than we think. Now that games have received their $10 hike, and especially after recent rumors suggesting that Sony was seriously considering an even higher price. Jim Ryan does contest this. I was wondering if you would provide an updated insight on this topic and whether you think an even higher price point standard would be justified and acceptable in your eyes. Even if the rumor is untrue, and it is. Would you think Sony would be shooting themselves in the foot by going forward with such a, such a suggestion? Thanks. Keep up the great work. I'm glad to be a returning patron. Cheers from Toronto. Thank you, Robbie. As they say it up in Canada, Trana. <laughs> now, the question here, Chris, from Robbie is, do I think that the $70 game is a good place to be? And my answer to that is, I think it's a fairer place to be, but I still think games are cheaper than they've ever been. They are. And even this adjustment doesn't really make up for a lost time. Remember, we've been we had a better time of 15 years at a $60 price point. Yeah. And um, it's something that well, it's that's a little bit extreme, but it's almost that long. And I feel like the games not just ignore inflation and the, the cost of, of doing business, but just how much it costs to make these games is and what the games provide for you, I think, is far beyond the $10 hike. So. I think the $10 hike is a nice place to not royal too many feathers. But, Chris, what I would say is there will not be a 10 to 15 year gap in between the next price hike, ubiquitous price hike. And I expect that they might even start hiking the prices again this generation. What do you think of that? I I don't think that's incorrect. But I also think that I th- we actually I feel like we have a window into how games are going to be made for this next generation going forward with with spider-man miles morales actually because that is that is a game that's very clearly you know it's a triple a game it's a first party game it's like a a, you know essentially a system seller at this point but it's also like shorter it's not as bloated it's not as big i I think there were plenty of executives talking or big people in the industry talking uh, like a 
even earlier this year about how like yeah maybe maybe the goal shouldn't be to make like 500 million dollar you know 40 hour 50 hour 60 hour games but just like something that's you know shorter and less expensive but still quality and i feel like that's probably in order to maintain that $70 i could see that just being the generalized route that game des- development goes instead of just kind of continuing to try and like make bigger and bigger and bigger games and you know just try and inflate the price to meet where production lands but those are the two, i feel like those are the two possible futures we either get to a future where like games are continuously bloated and continuously big and over overproduced and you know, we get to an eighty dollar price point. Oh, we or we stay at the seventy dollar seventy dollar price point with far more wise development structures and far more wise uh, investment from publishers and studios. Indeed, I, I think it's very well said, and I think what's exciting about this ecosystem is just the exploration of what is possible. Yeah, and I think it's possible to attract people with a game like Genshin Impact, in which you don't pay any money. And I'll say again, and I think it's possible to attract people with a hundred dollar retail. Style downloadable too, but restyle t- style retail style game. I think the market will determine what these games cost, and I'm really eager to see people explore this more. I think they're scared still. I think they have every reason to be scared. But once that seventy dollar price point hits, then I don't think it's going to be that crazy for a um. Well, we used to say like a CD project, but who knows what the hell they're going to do now with Cyberpunk? But a, a a company like that, a Bungie and come out and say like our game's worth more than this and we just need someone to do it and we need someone to prove it and then the proof will be in the pudding and hopefully then this race this everlasting race to the bottom that is by the way I was just thinking about this Chris is the kind of the root cause of all the issues we have in in the industry Mm -hmm. right loot boxes and gambling and free to play and casual infestation of hardcore games and I don't mean that by people I mean by ideas very much like the evolution of Mass Effect to Mass Effect 3. They're like almost indistinguishable from each other. I'm sorry, they're they're completely distinguishable from each other. I, I apologize. And so I just think that we have to have some proof that we can get more value. And I think that there are games that I've played and you've played and others have played where I would have gladly paid more yeah. than I paid for it. And I'm trying to put my money where my mouth is more these days. I went out and bought The Pathless, even though I've not had a chance to play it yet, and others because I'm afraid they're actually going to go down in price by the time <laughs> I get to them. And I'd like to support some of these guys as well so yeah i've heard great things about the pathless yeah i i have to i got to get there i have a guest this week so i just have not had a lot of time to play and we'll talk about that in a minute but the last thing i wanted to talk about here if you want to even discuss that this and it's really not that interesting i guess but well let's read it anyway jake whitaker wrote in said hey boys colin what do you use to wash your beard face wash body wash or shampoo i feel like an argument could be made for any of these please share your insights i none of the above i use bar soap to wash my face and my beard. Mm. Now, I used to use, you know, I have had these various sponsorships in the past, but I've also been recommended and have gone and bought these various, let's call them tinctures and elixirs Yeah, that you put in your beard, you wash your beard, you condition your beard, you put it in after you get out. Like some, some of it's like, you know, bee, beeswax and eucalyptus and all, whatever the fuck. So, and uh, <laughs> it's fine, but I felt like it was not really doing, and it was making it a little softer but I don't I feel like the poofiness of my beard goes away because of the, the bar soap because it's so dry. And and, I, and then I put my Luberderm all over my face and, you know, I, I make myself like into a little stick of butter, basically. Yeah. <laughs> if you tried to if you tried to try to hug me after I got a uh, put my Luberderm, I'd squeeze right out of your arms. That's shoot a, right up into the ceiling. That's a heinous image. Yeah, it is. It's not good. It's yeah. Not awful. A good image. So I hope that answers your question, Jake. All right. Chris, let's talk about what we're playing. It says here you're playing Godfall and Destiny 2 Beyond Light. I'm very eager to hear. What you have to say about Godfall? Yeah, so uh, listen, man, Godfall. I, I gave it. I gave it a chance. I was. I was playing through the. F- I tried to get through. I think the first hour, and I was absolutely taken aback by just how bad just the base combat is. And it's not even like I don't know how to play. It's not even like a oh, there's like a skill. I remember that was like an argument with Anthem when that when that came out. It's like, "Nah, dude, you're just not doing the combo system right." And it's like, "No, I'm sure there's like depth to it, but the core of it is just so unsatisfying. Godfall is like supposed to be this like looter slasher thing, which is like already like an eye rolly kind of term, but it's every 
every hit with every weapon just feels so unsatisfying. And it's made even worse by the fact that the dual senses uh, adaptive triggers are just completely broken. Like they just don't work in this game at all. Like it, 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 it gives you tension at completely random points and it just it pulls you out of the game constantly with these triggers to the point where I had to shut them off to even get anything feeling normal. And I, I don't know. It, it, it just feels like it feels like a free to play mobile game that has like a lot of graphical polish is the best way I can describe it. Like it, 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 it I, I don't know what the goal was, but it, it, it might be the least satisfying game that I, I've played this year. If not in the last like several weeks, I can't think of a game that I, I had less engagement in. You know, like yeah, it, it's uh, wild. It's, it's interesting because I'm I've kind of been looking at people's impressions of this game, and it just I don't feel like I f- I feel like there's anything enthusiastic about this game. I feel like I, there was even some enthusiasm depending on who you talk to for like Anthem and even like Fallout seventy six and stuff. I guess I'm just maybe I'm not looking in the right place, but I just feel like. I'm anecdotally not seeing any r- raw excitement for Godfall. I think the best that I've seen about it is like, it's fine. Yeah. I see a lot of complaints. I see a lot of complaints about its trophy list, which I think is weird. And I don't know. It just, it, it's not appealing to me at the core. So it's like the exact opposite of what I need. I need a game like this that is so appealing that I can't help but play it. And everything about Godfall is so unappealing and trite looking that I have literally no interest in playing it. Yeah. It's it's not good. It's just flat out not good. I think I, I, I was scouring because I was like I was scouring the Internet for like reviews because I'm like I felt so at odds with it. I felt like so repulsed by it that I was like, this can't be maybe this is just me. You know, maybe this is like a quirk of mine. And, and like there's something about this game that really puts me off on like a like an evolutionary level like it. But like cause I felt I, I've never I, I got to be real. Like I've never felt this 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 repulse by a game in, 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 in my entire life. So I was like looking for reviews and I found one positive review for Godfall. And within the first minute, it's a video review that says this video is sponsored by Gearbox. It was the only way that I could get a code <laughs> to review this. And I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta be that's, kidding me. That's no bueno. So I was like, all right, well I feel good. And then I saw some other people on Twitter talking about like, yeah, this is not good. And I was like, okay, good. Uh, I'm glad it wasn't. I'm glad it wasn't just me because I felt insane because I think the quality of its visuals kind of makes you feel like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be as unsatisfying as it is. You know what I mean? Definitely. It looks beautiful. Yeah. Like it, it's a gorgeous looking game. If, if the art style is a bit, you know, noisy and kind of, kind of generic, it, it still looks like, it looks like a, a next generation game for sure. But it's just makes it all the more confusing as to why it's just. Yeah, I don't I don't get this one. I mean, apart from just getting that launch thunder and the money that comes along with that. And I'm sure, you know, what is a counterplay? They're not a big team. Gearbox is a lucrative publisher. I'm sure that the money is being made. And, and you'll note that last week on the show, for those who didn't listen, we noted that in the new Godfall trailers, they're starting to talk about how the game is, is essentially not going to be on PS5 only and PC starting six months from launch. So sometime in May. And they might be eager to do that because I'm sure that there was probably pretty soft reception of this game in terms of pre-sales and stuff, especially because you're going to kind of rely on word of mouth for a game like this to bring it along as people get through Miles Morales and Sackboy and Demon Souls, especially and others. So I don't know. I, I I'd be really no, I'd be interested to know the player count on PS5 for this game. It's also on PC, so yeah. we'll can. And I I'd be interested to know also what their plan is for long term support, which I don't think we've heard too much about. So yeah, I don't know. We'll see. And then it says here as well, Chris, you're playing Destiny Two Beyond Light. So yeah, I talk mean to me about that. Yeah, I mean obviously I'm a Destiny guy. Like uh, this is no surprise to anybody. But you know it's it is more destiny 2 there's a bunch of new enemy types that I, I i really enjoy the new destination in europa is is really great and really fun to explore the weather system that they've added the new lighting is really cool they've added the cosmodrome from d1 back in and that has a bunch of like lost sectors and new activities in it it's it's a cool it's a really good update i i really enjoy it uh there's a new subclass which is like the first time that that's happened in like a long probably ever i think so it's really good update. It feels like it feels like this is Destiny Three in some ways. It feels like a, a far more substantial update than they've had in the past, and 
story's wicked good and you know the characters are really fleshed out it's it's really really good i i i'm enjoying it but you know i i've been on the destiny train for a while so it's not all that surprising that i would like it yeah it's uh it's this is another one of those games that's just going to persistently eat into a game like godfall you just have to do better and destiny is kind of the example of that yeah. one of the examples of that it's kind of a huge it's kind of a huge example of that what's well, the it's yeah. the main one it was it was i think the first one you know, it, it was uh, De- Destiny was first, and then I think the Division was shortly after. But those were the earliest examples, and Destiny just really, you know, they fumbled out the gate, and they, you know, they learned a lot of lessons, and then they fumbled a little more, and then they learned some lessons, and and now they're in this place where it's like this is just a really solid example of this genre, and probably like the only, the only great example of this kind of like live service kind of pseudo MMO genre done well i think the the division two is a great game with elements of those like the, the like the division two is like a fantastic like you know squad third person tactical shooter like the, i think it's great in that regard but as a live service game i feel like it you know it's it's not all that compelling like I, i'm not really like I, I don't really play the division two for the loot you know what i mean I, I play it just because it's like oh you know it's it's, it's fun to move around and you know just engage in combat and Destiny is the same way, but it's equally about the loot in that game. And it's like, it's one of the f- few examples, aside from like, obviously Borderlands, which I think is the king of, uh, even still, of that genre, the, the like the looter shooter craze. I, th- I think uh, for any game to try and challenge Destiny, it, it really needs to understand the lessons that it learned right off the bat and also just be way better, which I think is just hard because the quality of that game, both in art direction and and game design and, and gameplay is just so high that it's it's almost not even a worthy endeavor to try and challenge it. Mm. Yeah, it's well, it's what we say about a lot of games. Like when a game does something well, whether it's a, a system, an upgrade tree, control scheme, whatever, it's always worth looking at that. And you always bring up the example of how Bioware was instructed not to look at Destiny when they were making Anthem. And that was a huge mistake. And you can see the results of that. Yeah. Uh, as for me, I've been messing around still with Spider-Man, Miles Morales. As I said, I have a guest here this week, so I haven't been playing too much, unfortunately. Just haven't had too much time. But the one thing that stands out to me with this game, I'm really enjoying it. Just swinging around. It's gorgeous. The the lighting and the ray traits. It really, I mean, I, I'm not a tech guy and I notice the differences, including in the frame rate, which I wanted to give you a, a tip of the cap to as well. Yeah. But the thing that is standing out to me about this game, which I'm, I, I haven't read too much. I haven't read really anything. And, and that, but I have not seen people just kind of casually mention this is that Miles Morales is like really story heavy. There's a, and I don't mind it, but there are times where you're putting the controller down for what seems like 10 minutes or more in cutscenes. I don't want to spoil it because I know people haven't played it yet, but and I haven't gotten very far, but it just feels like I'm a little surprised by how much people like it because it's really fun to play. Yeah, but there's a lot of exposition. I was really surprised and it's been a while since I played the original Spider-Man in 2018, which we'll talk about in a moment as well in the news. But I don't remember it being like that. Do you have a similar take for the game? I think early on, it's it's a little story heavy. I I think when I was doing New Game Plus and I wanted to just get into the game, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Like the beginning's pretty, pretty cutscene loaded. But it's it's I think it's like Spider-Man PS4 in the sense that like in the, like once you once you get past like that intro uh, that intro those introductory set of missions, uh, I think it really opens up and it becomes like, yeah, it's 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 Spider-Man. It's it's damn good, though. I, I really loved my time with Spider-Man Miles Morales. I'm doing New Game Plus right now, and it's really sad. I, I think the biggest thing do the combat is so much better, I think. It is. It's fun. I love doing those super attacks. Yeah. You hold on the L1 button. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's super satisfying. I think it adds a lot more dimensions. I, I like that there's not as many gadgets also. Like, I feel like in Spider-Man PS4, as much as I enjoyed it, uh, those gadgets really kind of became kind of to- just I totally forgot about most of them because there were so many and so many of them did very little uh, that I was like, ah, you know, there's there's not really any reason to keep using these. But like because they're so few. Uh, there's only four main gadgets that you have in Miles Morales, and it's like because they're so few, it, it it's a lot less daunting to decide to want to use one. And you know, there's all these like visor mods and armor mods, and you know, venom attacks, and it, it's really from a combat perspective, I think it's it's really a, a step up to the point where I'm wondering 
you know, if they do make this Spider-Man 2, it's probably going to feel weird going back to Peter Parker not having that ability. Yeah, we're going to find out. It's a good point. It's a really good point. At least they're differentiating them, which is kind of cool. Yeah, no, it's great. So we have a question, though, about Miles Morales, which is for you. Mm -hmm. David Rivera wrote into us and said, hello, Italian Colin and Buracua. How do you say that? How do you say that? (laughs) Uh, Buracua. Buracua. Bariqua. Well, I know that word from rap songs, I think. Yeah. For, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, it means it's basically just Puerto Rican. It means somebody from from Puerto Rico or from or descendant from Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Bariqua Morena. <laughs> yeah. What, what song is that? I, think, uh, I can't think. Of, oh, man. I forget the name of it. But I. I Bariqua. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember that. From when I was anyway, uh, he says long time listener. First time submitting a question. The question is for Chris. What are your thoughts on Puerto Rican Spider-Man? As a fellow Puerto Rican, I was extremely proud of seeing a game that is not only being played all over this country, but all around the world, showcasing our culture, not only with all times. No, I'm sorry, not only with all times, all the times the flag is shown, but the scene when they are cooking our traditional foods. And all right. So he says tostones, tostones, uh, aroco candules and flan. OK, with our typical holiday music and our language, just wanted your thoughts. Keep making a great podcast. So, yeah, what do you think, Chris? You're a Puerto Rican. So, yeah, it's. It's really kind of interesting because I I don't really think I've ever thought about, you know, representation in video games in this way because I I just don't think I've ever seen it. Like, Puerto Rico is a very, like, you know, we, we get a lot of video games about, like, you know the spanish you know we we like we we know spain and like mexico and like even south america is pretty prevalent a lot of like i know just cause and like mercenaries and like all these other games like you've seen that kind of present quite a bit but i I didn't realize until this game that i've just straight up never seen puerto rico in anything video game related like ever and it, it really did kind of uh stick out to me and it was nice that i felt like it was uh handled very well it didn't feel ham-fisted it didn't feel like uh people it didn't feel like they were just doing like a checklist thing it really felt like people like knew what the hell they were doing all the interactions felt authentic you know all the the language the fact that it isn't just spanish but that specific dialect of spanish and i like remember hearing it like in my house and it was like this is really interesting and really cool and i kind of you know i I totally get it like i totally get the idea of like yeah you know if you see something represented like that it's it's really cool because you know this is it's really cool to me that just the idea that you know this is a obviously a playstation first party game and the idea that a first party spider-man video game you know that's probably going to be played pretty heavily in in japan i would imagine is going to be like covered in Puerto Rican imagery though. That's fucking fascinating because I don't know if they would, I don't know if any Japanese media really has any reason to have even to even know what Puerto Rico is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they might even assume it's just kind of a a part of, it is a part of the United States, but yeah, yeah, but, but but just another part of the United States. It has its own culture and its own heritage. Yeah, no, but it's not a state. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's wild, (laughs) but it's, yeah, it was it was really nice. I really appreciated it. It it felt authentic. It was um I really loved it. It was really good. It definitely made it uh more of a an experience for me than I think it otherwise would have been. And uh yeah, I don't know. I th- I think they did it. They handled everything really really well. Cool. I'm glad that that stuck out to you. It stuck it sticks out to me too. I mean, having grown up in New York and and just been around Puerto Rican culture my whole life and seeing those flags and everything, it's it did feel very yeah. authentic in terms of being home. That's the thing, too. It's like because it's New York also, it's like it, it It made me kind of like I thought back. I thought back to all the games that I've played that took place in New York. And I'm like, wow, it, it really is kind of wild how weird those games feel now, <laughs> because it's like, yeah, that's like a huge part of uh, like there are more Puerto Ricans in New York City than there are in Puerto Rico, like literally. <laughs> so so the fact that, uh, you know, this is the first time I've ever se- I'm ever seeing this flag in a video game is, is pretty wild. And I'm sure there might be like some like uh, some niche examples of like, I don't know, maybe there's like a steam game or something or, you know, but yeah, it was it was cool. I really appreciated it. Right on. Well, Spider-Man Miles Morales available now on PS4 and PS5. So everyone that's listening can pretty much get their hands on it if they'd like. Thank you for writing in, David. 
All right, Christopher, let's get into the news. There aren't that many items this week, but there are a few extensive ones that we need to discuss here. And this first one, I, I struggled with how to talk about it. So I'm going to present it first and then I'll talk about that struggle and then we'll we'll kind of disseminate the appropriate information, let's say. So this is number one. You may have learned in recent weeks about a rather devastating hack perpetrated upon Japanese publisher and developer Capcom, one apparently executed in the name of ransom, a ransom which Capcom apparently will not pay. Capcom itself revealed the hack, which noted that tons of data was compromised and copied, including internal employee information, the personal information of thousands and thousands of customers and less concerning for us, but very concerning for Capcom sales data, partner data, internal planning documents and much, much more. We won't report on this podcast on the minutia of the leaks, but we will talk about the upcoming games that look to be in the pipeline as it affects our ecosystem. The following are apparently unannounced games in the leak, along with their planned released quarters, as relayed by website Push Square. So Capcom was hacked. It's a shit ton of documents. You can go look at them if you want. And these are the games that were noted as as in the pipeline that are unannounced and when approximately they'll be coming. Although we don't have platforms, you can assume every one of these games will be at least on PS4 and PS5. So here they are. Resident Evil Outrage in Q4 2021, Dragon's Dogma 2 in Q2 2022, Street Fighter 6 in Q3 2022, a game called Mega Man Match in Q3 2022. That could be a puzzle game. Resident Evil 4 Remake in Q4 2022, which we already kind of know about. Animusha New Work, which is fucking awesome. In Q4 2022, Monster Hunter 6 in Q2 2023, Biohazard Apocalypse in Q3 2023, Super Street Fighter 6 in Q4 2023, Final Fight Remake yeah. in Q2 2024, Power Stone Remake in 2024. I feel bad for them. Ultra Street Fighter 6 in Q4 2024 and a game called Resident Evil Hank. Hank in Q4 2024. <laughs> so in addition to that, there are a few other games that are noted outside of lists, but in kind of the vernacular and they might be sooner. So it looks like Capcom is going to release the Ace Attorney games, the great Ace Attorney games, which are 3DS games on PS4 in July of 2021 mm-hmm. with trophies. Of course, this is very similar to what they did more recently with uh what did they release the phoenix right oh yeah they did release the phoenix right game so these are the next games the great ace attorney games they released yeah. the ace attorney games already the gba slash ds ports of those and uh so there's that and then there is something in here yeah because i'm looking at uh gamerant.com there is a multiplayer project called shield that apparently is in development uh we don't know much about that and there's a title called guillotine that apparently will come to Switch first and then other platforms. There's also another project codenamed Raiwa, R-E-I-W-A. But the major bulk of the leak here is financial data, sales data. I mean, if you read some of it, it's kind of crazy. It like shows you, it shows you like when their third party partners hit landmark, like uh, milestones on their games and how much they get paid for those milestones. Like you reach milestone one, you get 600 grand. You reach milestone two, you get 1.2 million. Like there's a lot of really interesting if you're into that stuff and I am. Yeah, it's just a lot of interesting insight into how games are made, how they speculate, how much games will cost to make. I mean, there's a lot of data in there. But here's the thing is that I don't want to dive too deeply into it because it's hacked data. And even though I could legally look at it, it's everywhere. It's like, you know, I I don't want to compare them, but it's like when Snowden leaked everything. It's like, well, once it's out there. Yeah, it's out there. Yeah, yeah, no, at a, at a certain point, at a certain point, it just sort of becomes like public information and you just kind of ha- can't help it because everybody's going to be talking about it anyway. Right, precisely. So, so yeah, what, what do you, what do you, um, what do you make, I mean, what do you make of all this? I, mean, I go wherever I, you want. I mean, I think this, this really sucks for them. Uh, this is, uh, pretty much several, at the start of a new generation, this is pretty much the first five years just, uh, of thunder just completely stolen, uh, from them. So that's like really, really sad but you know i nothing necessarily stands out to me i i know it's super street fighter you know what is that six yeah six yeah i know that's kind of wild considering how how long it's been since super since street fighter 5 even was a thing uh final fantasy or final fight remake is, is kind of cool yeah it's awesome yeah no the, the biggest thing to me the one that, that catches my eye is resident evil 4 remake in q4 2022 because that kind of yeah. implies that that's a bigger game than previously assumed. 
you know, given given how like quickly in between releases Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 remake is, that's kind of a that's a huge jump in, you know, in time. So I, I, I it makes me kind of excited because it, it makes me feel like they're actually putting some uh, some real, uh, you know, some real elbow grease into this thing. If they're planning for Q4 of 2022, that's a while. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's unclear. I think these are calendar dates. It's It could be lined up with their fiscal years, too. So I don't exactly know. I just want to throw that out there. But I think that the dates are based on calendar years here. Mm-hmm. So you're right. And it's it's different just because, I mean, when you even think about the original Resident Evil 4, that came out in early 2005. They typically don't release Resident Evil games in the holidays. And I think that that's kind of where they belong. Like, it would be really nice to get Resident Evil 4 remake for Halloween, for instance, in the October just because of that game's brown and gray aesthetic and the, the fall, the autumnness, let's say, of the game. I think it would make a lot of sense there. The Street Fighter 6 stuff, I think, is funny just because they have already planned Super Street Fighter and Ultra Street Fighter. And if I was a Street Fighter fan, I'd be like, fucking Christ, you're really going to do this? Like every year you're going to release a new one? Not, not unlike what they've done in the past, but it's just kind of shitty to see that so far out written down. And then the the other thing that really stands out to me, I mean, there's a, I mean, pretty much every one of these stand out to me. Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be huge. I mean, I think that's going to be a huge game for them. There's been a real appetite for Dragon's Dogma. There was that Arisen or Awaken or whatever the hell they did expansion. But and then Animusha has been dormant for um, by the time if this game comes out in at the end of 2022, Animusha would have been dormant for it. And this is unbelievable for, for me to even say 18 years. You know, or yeah, yeah, 16 years, because I think, no, it would be like 17 years, because I think Animusha 4 came out when I was in a junior in college. So, yeah, it would have been around 2005, 2006. And they did release, people might remember in early 2019, they released the original Animusha Mm -hmm, on PS4. So I think that they were testing the waters. I am a big fan of that franchise, and it's kind of nice to see it live again. And then of course we have this Mega Man match game. I don't know if that's going to be a puzzler. It's a little disappointing not to see Mega Man 12 in here. That makes me a little bit nervous. Also, I don't know if that's just a code name. This could be the vaunted Mega Man, like third person action game that I've wanted for a really long time since, since Mega Man legends really. So what if it's a mobile game? What if it's a, a, a like a, a <laughs> like a match game? That's what it kind of sounds like. And that's what I'm getting a little afraid of, but it seems so out of place on this other list of games. Cause they do do mobile games too. But none of these other games will be mobile. Monster Hunter 6, maybe, I don't, I doubt it, but I don't know. And then, of course, there's a lot of switching here. They go from Resident Evil, even in the Japanese source, they go from Resident Evil to Biohazard to Resident Evil. And for those that don't know, those are the same franchises. So depending on where you are. So they have Resident Evil Outrage and then Biohazard Apocalypse and then Resident Evil Hank, which is a little bit weird. I wonder what that's all about. It's a little little weird that up just to. Yeah, Resident Evil. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this is. I mean, did I? Yeah, I'm, I'm making sure that I didn't write it down wrong. This is this is it. I mean, this is what it says in all these sources. So a lot of Resident Evil planned, a little bit of Animusha, a little bit of uh, Monster Hunter. Conspicuous absences include, from my point of view, No Dead Rising in here, mm-hmm. which is not not a huge problem for me. But there's also nothing like uh, Shinobi or Bionic Commando or anything like that that they would be messing around with either. So I'm just paying attention to. I'm not. I'm not Shinobi Strider. Rather, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm paying attention to all those as well. I just hope this isn't a complete look at what they're planning for the AAA space. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you. Like it's just part of something. Yeah, but I bet you it's not. I bet you this is it. You know, I bet you this is the the AAA movement, and that's what really sucks because, like you said. If this all holds, we know what they're going to release for the next four years. And you can't just take these away. I mean, these are all games that are in various forms of production. So <laughs> nor would you want to do that just because it leaked. But it does suck. Like every game they announce, we're going to be like, yeah, we know. With the exception of those three codename games, which we don't really know anything about right now. Yeah. So, man, they must be freaking out. Yeah, that but yeah. really fucking sucks. <laughs> but uh, uh, caught, caught up in all this, and I do want to reiterate is... I guess uh, it's kind of vague right now, but I get and you can go read the Capcom blog post. They did talk about this. They're the ones, by the way, to their credit, they're the ones that told everyone about this. So they didn't wait for the ransomware guys to start leaking everything, which I appreciate. A lot of companies would wait and see. But they do note that there is a lot of user data in here of various kinds and then a lot of their employee data, including like HR shit and all sorts. I mean, for their employees, this shit sucks. There's probably a lot of stuff in there. 
that you wouldn't want to read about yourself, like your reports and reviews and all. You know what I mean? So, yeah, just, I kind of I kind of feel bad for them from that perspective. But you got to protect your shit. And I don't know how I, I guess they might have gotten access through some sort of um, Trojan or something. But yeah, I don't know. I don't It'd be, I don't know for sure. Yeah, it's just all speculative. So I'm sure they'll do like a full audit of it and we'll, and we'll read about it. But in the meantime, that's as much as I want to talk about it. You got, There's much more to say. I just don't know that I want to give it the light of day on this show, but that's not going to stop you guys from going and doing what you want to do. Number two, it looks like PlayStation's exclusive Spider-Man game launched on PlayStation 4 in 2018 from Insomniac Games is an even bigger hit than we once thought. Last we heard, the game surpassed 13 million units sold, but based on a throwaway, a throwaway line on a LinkedIn profile, from Sony's senior manager of global brand marketing, a guy named David Bull, a.k.a. someone who would know. We now know that the game has surpassed 20 million units sold, which will make it PlayStation's best-selling exclusive ever. It's unclear why Sony hasn't officially revealed these numbers, though the source of them makes the data essentially ironclad. Launched in September of 2018, Spider-Man is now available on PlayStation 5 as well, so long as you buy a certain version of Miles Morales. Insomniac Games, which was a second-party team at the time of Spider-Man's development and launch, is now a first-party studio. Also a hard at work on Ratchet & Clank, A Rift Apart, which we know is a PS5 exclusive. We forgot to bring that up earlier. That is not a cross-gen game. What do you think of these sales numbers? I mean, I, at, at some point, the number doesn't really become that impressive because what would be more impressive is to know gross revenue. In other words, how much they're charging for these games. Because if you're char- if you're selling half of them at $10, I don't know that it's that impressive. And we don't know that data. But I assume most of them were sold at, if not... $60 retail pricing then pretty close and 20 million units is far and away more units sold as we know than Uncharted 4 which was the last best selling PS4 slash PlayStation all time exclusive game so what do you think I think this puts into context a few things right Chris number one the acquisition of Insomniac number two Miles Morales is a standalone kind of stopgap until we get Spider-Man 2 and it's cross-generational nature. I think all of it makes a lot more sense knowing this. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think so. Um, I mean, it's it's no surprise to me. I think Spider-Man is just such a an easily marketable figure. Like the second you see a Spider-Man video game on, you know, on a shelf for PlayStation, especially for PlayStation exclusively, you're like, oh yeah, that's definitely... I'm definitely buying that <laughs> for myself and for whoever else would potentially play anything. So it's it's the same reason why Avengers sold super well. You know, it's just like Marvel Marvel sells, and I think people know that. And the fact that it hit 20 million isn't surprising to me necessarily. What is surprising to me is that they just never said it because I feel like they would have said it. Yeah, I don't know what they were waiting for with that one. Yeah, so like I wonder if this is if if well, it can't be. At the same time, like I, part of me is like, is this counting the millions of people who probably got the upgraded edition from the Miles Morales pre-order? Or I doubt the it. Hell? Like I doubt. I it. doubt that. Yeah. Like I doubt yeah. it. But at the same time, it's like, why? Why wouldn't you? This, 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 this. Those are such good numbers. Like, why wouldn't you tout that? You know, it's weird. Yeah, like I, are, I would tout are, that. I'd be like, yeah, our game, our. The Spider-Man game just sold 20 million units. Also, this is our new best-selling PS4 exclusive. And, you know, we found this out because some guy named da- David Bull. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's it's a big it's pretty big news. You're absolutely right. There's got to be some sort of strategy and not talking about it. Maybe they wanted to wait for Miles Morales's numbers to settle and then do a combined Spider-Man has sold 25 million or something like that kind of thing. But it's an impressive it's an impressive feat. With a one in six or so attach rate, which is pretty high for PlayStation. PlayStation doesn't have any games like that. And so this was really an important game. And I knew Spider-Man was going to be big. And I'm so glad Insomniac did a great job with it. But I don't think I could have told you it was going to be this big. And I think it's what we discussed last week, right? You have this situation where not everything Marvel prints money. Like we talked about with the Avengers from Square Enix. And we even talked about Marvel Ultimate Alliance, which barely sold any copies. No one gave a shit about it. It's when you do the games really well that people pay attention and it's the same thing with arkham on the other side with yeah DC and, yeah but i i think and, you so, also yeah. but when you also have like Mar- i think it's less about marvel and more spider i think spider-man as a character is probably more maybe this is insane to say but i feel like spider-man as a character is more recognizable broadly than marvel is yeah, you know that, what i mean that's probably true i mean that's probably true like i i 
Yeah, I don't know. Like, that feels correct to me. Like, that character is just so marketable and so beloved by, like, basically everybody. And when you have that combined with the pedigree that involves being a PlayStation 4 exclusive, I think I think you get pretty good word of mouth and you have a, a game that essentially is a, a must-purchase. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, like, if I'm, like, a, a father or, like, a parent and, you know, my kid just got a PS4 and I'm looking at all the games that I could potentially buy him, he's, like, a young or whatever the hell, he's, like, seven or eight or, or 10 or 11 or 15 any number of those any one of those ages i'm looking at all the games and i'm probably going to pick spider-man like 90 percent of the time you know just definitely it, you're you're absolutely right i mean it, yeah. it's a brand in and of itself that isn't it those are sure. impressive sales obviously obviously like it's 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 shockingly good but I, I mean if any of them were if any of those properties those first party ip were going to hit 20 million it, it definitely would be spider-man well, again, it, it puts a lot of these moves behind the scenes in the context a little bit. And no, oh, certainly still think I still think Insomniac was a huge get for Sony, but we'll see how it all turns out. This next one was just announced today when we're recording this, and it was surprising, although I'm, I'm curious to think what you, see what you think of it. Number three, IO Interactive, the Danish studio best known for its Hitman franchise, has announced its new game, and it's something entirely unexpected, an official 007 game. Codename Project 007 IO wrote on its website that it's, quote, a brand new James Bond video game to be developed and published by IO Interactive, featuring a wholly original Bond story. Players will step into the shoes of the world's favorite secret agent to earn their 00 status in the very first James Bond origin story, end quote. It appears the game is in early pre-production. IO is actively hiring the team that will make it. Other than a throwaway teaser trailer, there's no other information provided. IO's, IO's first Hitman game came to PC in 2000, and other than a few deviations in the form of Kane and Lynch and Mini Ninjas, Hitman is all the studio knows. Indeed, it's readying Hitman 3 for launch on PS4 and PS5 in early 2021. The James Bond series began in the form of books by Ian Fleming, which ran from 1953 until 1966, and since then by other novelists as well. However, 007 is best known by far for the film series, which began in 1962 with Dr. No and will continue in 2021 with No Time to Die. James Bond video games draw their heritage all the way back to the early 80s, though the rare developed N64 exclusive game GoldenEye, launched in 1997, is by far the most beloved, most critically acclaimed and commercially successful Bond game ever. Ben Sender wrote into us on Patreon. He says, is there a more, a more perfect pairing than the James Bond IP and IO Interactive? The answer to that is, I don't know. I'm not a huge James Bond fan by any means. I'm wondering, Chris, you're a big Hitman fan and IO fan. I don't know how you feel about Bond, but what do you think of this uh, this acqu this announcement? By the way, they did this all themselves. They're not working with a publisher, so it's pretty impressive that they they managed to um, negotiate all this with MGM and others without a publisher doing it for them. Yeah, no, I mean, IO is definitely like a talented group of people. They definitely know what the hell they're doing. They make good shit. I think it makes sense in some ways, and in some ways it doesn't. I, I think the tone is perfect. Like, I think tonally, I think they could make a... A pretty great Bond game. I, I don't necessarily have like a huge affinity for James Bond or like a huge knowledge of of James Bond as like a as a series or or, or whatever. But like I I do feel like they could potentially make a really great James Bond game tonally and 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 narratively and just sort of like they could get that feel right. But I, I, I the uh, the gameplay department because Hitman is so much of a sandbox. And James Bond is so much of like a, almost like a Call of Duty kind of action thrill ride. I, I, I like a roller coaster ride almost. I, I wonder. I don't know. Like, I, I wonder what the gameplay of an IO Interactive James Bond game would be, if not just Hitman with a James Bond skin. Yeah, it, well, I, it seems like they don't even really know since they're hiring for the team. I guess they have some sort of concept. It could be some. I kind of hope it's not like Hitman, but it, that's their wheelhouse, you know? Yeah. Even when you think of mini ninjas and stuff like you think about a game with like kind of open worlds and a little bit of nonlinear linearity and choice. And obviously Hitman, like you said, is predicated on that. But I don't know. It must make sense in some way. But I think it's going to be a little while before we see it, because even the trailer, like the teaser trailer is nothing but, you know, that famous you know, the guy walks across, you know, Bond walks across the gun barrel thing and yeah, points at yeah. The, it's, it's nothing like I could have made that today, you know, like right. it's yeah, <laughs> I was I was shocked by how stupid it was, actually. But, you know, they have to have something, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if they went through the, the trouble of negotiating the rights to this IP on their own, like surely they must have 
uh, an idea that they feel is pretty good. I, I just wonder if it's going to be a good gameplay match because that's that's the one thing where I'm like, I don't know. Like, I love Hitman games, but like, I don't know if like if you're somebody who's like, man, I'm really I'm really looking for a James Bond video game. And then you get Hitman. I feel like you're going to be disappointed. We'll find out maybe in 2028, 2028. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's it's worth noting. I was not even released their newest game, so I don't know how many of them are there now, but they're probably all hands on deck with Hitman in the meantime. All right. This one's kind of interesting. I was not able to read the full piece because it's on the Telegraph, which is behind a paywall, but I did the best I could by citing other stories. So here it is. Number four. Jim Ryan, PlayStation CEO and president who has naturally been on a whirlwind press tour promoting the launch of PlayStation 5, gave an interview with British newspaper The Telegraph that should give us pause when we consider PlayStation's approach to cross-gen games. When asked about Sony's strategy in supporting both PS4 and PS5 and how that affects their studio's pipelines, he said in part, quote, The first thing to say is that our PS5 experiences or versions of these games are built from the ground up to take advantage of the PS5 feature set. So I think offering a PS5 version of these games for the PS5 community and then a PS4 version of these games for the PS4 community, I don't see what's wrong with that. We've got a community of PS4 gamers 100 million strong. It would be wrong to walk away from those people too early. And they've been really engaged with their PS4s this year under lockdown to a greater extent than at any point over the course of the cycle. They're using their PlayStations. They're happy with their PlayStations. Why would we stop giving them games? End quote. Jim Ryan is certainly correct. PS4 has sold nearly 115 million units to life to date, and there's still plenty of money to be made there. However, with games like Spider-Man, Miles Morales and Sackboy, a big adventure being cross-gen at launch and with 2021's Horizon Forbidden West also being a cross-gen game, it's natural to wonder what will become of Sony Santa Monica's recently announced God of War Ragnarok also promised on PS5 in 2021. But is it coming to PS4 too? Quote, sorry, I've got nothing to say about that today. Quote, end quote. He curtly answered. Carol Demochkin wrote into us and said, hey, CDC, I'll get right to the question. What's up with God of War Ragnarok? In a recent interview, Jim Ryan dodged the question about its exclusivity. I think this just means that it will be cross gen. But what do you think? Could it be something more unexpected? So (laughs) I think he answered the question, don't you think, Chris? (laughs) Yeah, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think it's coming to PS4. I don't see why he would not say that. Yeah. Uh, If it wasn't. How are you? How do you feel about that? I mean, you're a bigger God of War fan than I am. I'm dis. I'm a bigger Horizon fan than you are. I'm disappointed. Forbidden West is coming to PS4. You are what? That Ragnarok looks like it will be coming to PS4. I, I, I'm always of multiple minds about these kinds of things. I'm disappointed in the sense that I know that it will be limited in some in some way, just because it's and not even in the in the same way that like. You know, there there was a uh, there's a conversation in uh, in the PC space dating back forever, saying like, oh, you know, consoles are holding games back. You know, like, oh, it's you know, uh, this game could be so much better if it was just PC centric, and then you go on PC and like, you know, in 2009, and you're getting like Minecraft. You know, and I I don't normally agree with the notion that like just because something is also on previous generation hardware, it holds it back. But given the SSD. And what we clearly see is capable in like Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart that is not capable on PS4. It It is a little disappointing to know that, you know, this game that's coming out two years after. I mean, obviously two years after. Uh, they, they, I think they're still saying it's 2021. No way. Uh, yeah, 2022 I, I agree with you. Yeah. Is still going to be kind of rooted in this hardware that obviously isn't going to be able to utilize the... the this new machine that you paid money for to its fullest potential. That's disappointing to me. At the same time, God of War PS4 was fantastic, and there's no reason to assume that God of War 2 or God of War Ragnarok, whatever the hell they call it, won't also be fantastic, even if it is limited to that feature set. And it is also nice that the game will be available to far more people than it otherwise would be if it was just stranded on PS5. So, like, I see the positives, I see the negatives. I'm sure the game's going to be great, but it it would be nice to have something that could really tout that, you know, full reliance on next-gen hardware to really just push the necessity of this thing. Because as it stands, like, if you if you don't need a PS5 to play God of War Ragnarok, I, I why get it? Unless you're just somebody who, you know, cares a lot about resolution and frame rate like me. 
uh, if you're just interested in playing the games, and I don't, I don't know if you have much of a reason to get a PS5 now or for the next <laughs> two years, it seems. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, I, I have a lot to say about this, I think. I don't know how how deep I want to get into it, but Jim Ryan was at the phalanx before PS5 came out of saying, we believe in generations. That's what he kept saying, right? He said that. And it was in response, tacitly at least, to what Phil Spencer and, and crew were doing at Xbox with not really having any exclusives. I mean, they have no exclusives on their console. Right now, they really don't. But I, I'm saying when their first party games start coming out, they're really all going to be for everything. And this is where the whole smart, whatever the fuck it is, delivery thing comes in. And Yeah, yeah. And also and also they're going to have, you know, the their main IP are going to also be on PC as well. Right. So a whole nother step of unexclusivity, let's say. Yeah. And so Sony was just talking a different game. And I don't know what the plan is now. I, I feel what Jim Ryan is saying. I think he's right. Like it is nuts to walk away from these from the player base. And they might have seen they might have felt a certain way and then saw what COVID did to the PS4. And we're like, well, maybe we are walking away from this thing too soon. I mean, it, people are engaging with this thing like never before. And obviously they knew that they were going to be supply constrained with PS5 as well, which is why I predicted and was right about Miles Morales being multi-platform or cross gen and why, again, Forbidden West is going to be cross gen as well. I just don't really buy some of the vernacular he's using. He says, quote, the first thing to say is that our PS5 experiences or versions of these games are built from the ground up to take advantage of the PS5 feature set. Well, no, they're not. I mean, they're they're clearly not. You you can't po- just port games between these two platforms. You've got to do things to them. And I just feel like having you got to aim to the lowest common denominator. Otherwise, you're making two different games. I mean, it's just it's more work for your teams and it might it might be worth it monetarily for them to do that. But we need something, like you said, to justify this console. And I understand waiting a little while for that. But if we're going into the next holiday season, let's say they're right, Chris, and uh, God of War 2 comes out in 2021. Forbidden West comes out in the summer. God of War comes out in, in the holiday season. I think that's both. That's Those are both ridiculous predictions. But it's like, well, to your point, why do I need a PS5? Where are the PS5 games? It's not to say, in other words, that I mind that they're putting games on PS4. Sackboy, a big adventure. It's like, who gives a shit? Miles Morales with these new sales numbers from Spider-Man. Of course, you want to tap into that. And even with Horizon, which is a 10 plus million seller. But I'm just concerned because we really don't know other than Demon Souls, which is already out. And now Ratchet and Clank, we have no knowledge of and Demon's Souls is really not even a first party game. We have no knowledge of what's coming out of the first party for PS5 only. And yeah, I'm concerned about that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to say it's going to matter. It's clearly doesn't matter. You can't find a PS5 fucking anywhere. I've been reading things. People paying a thousand dollars for their PS5s. So clearly people want it. But do you understand what I'm saying? I just feel like we can't wait so long. You yeah, know? yeah, and, I, and to be fair, like I do think the PS5 justifies itself in a lot of ways. I think the, I think the boost in frame rate, I think the boost in resolution is is night and day noticeable. Uh, I see it like my my roommate uh, is plays uh, Spider Man Miles Morales in the living room on his PS4, and it and it, it's 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 almost like looking at somebody playing like an N64 compared to like an Xbox 360. It's like it, it's really surprisingly noticeable like when you're looking back and forth like it doesn't look at, it doesn't look that way when you're like looking at video comparisons that are like both run through the same capture card on like or even through like digital foundry and stuff like they look more or less on par but like side by side man it's it's a shocking difference so like i i do think it it's going to sell and, and it has reasons to exist and you, you have reasons to get it but i i, I do want that experience that is like you know solely for this machine like and and that was kind of what I had what I liked about this generation going in whereas it felt like Microsoft and Sony were going different routes where it's like okay I can rely on Microsoft to be this like kind of like ever ever evolving consistent library where my shit works wherever I play it and you know everything's gonna be cross-gen whatever that's fine like I'm totally fine with that that's I'm on board but a lot of that a lot of being okay with that came from the the kind of assumption that PS5 would be the place that I could go to, you know, to have those like, OK, well, here's something that's just here. Sure. Um, so I don't know. We'll we'll see how things go. I, I think, like you said, I think they're right 
to f- to also put these games out on PS4. A hundred a hundred plus million consoles out in the wild. It, it, it is stupid to just walk away from them, especially like within a year, even two years. I think it is too soon. Also, and and we know how long they kept up with the PS2 uh, before they finally shut the door on that thing. So. You know, it, it's not surprising to me, but like the jump in, in technology is so impressive this time that like it, it really, you know, I, I just we need to hear more about stuff that's really going to be marquee and, and uh, definitive of this machine, I think. Yeah, I think you're absolutely I mean, very well said. I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's a little different because you were talking about like PS2 is a good example of a console waiting around, staying around for a long time. And. God of War 2, the original God of War 2 famously came to PS2 after PS3 had come out. So it's not that it's unprecedented. It's just that this long, this long lead in with cross gen games is unheard of and in the Sony ecosystem. And like we never really got many cross gen games like when PS3 came out, they told Sony totally abandoned PS2 with the exception of from the first party, with the exception of some stuff from Sony London and SingStar and iPad and stuff. But they were off the console. And what we're seeing here from PS4 to PS5 is not only first parties staying on board, but releasing games, what it looks like maybe two years afterwards. And it's just different. And it just goes against. It's not to say that they're not right. This, I think, to your point, is the right move. You'd be stupid as shit to walk away to a loyal fan base that wants to play your console, especially when they can't even buy your new console. But I'm concerned about it just from the sense of like, I want to see what next gen really looks like. And at this point, Say what you will about PS3 to PS4, but we knew what next gen looked like. We had way more of next gen games, like true next gen games known about at this point than we do for PS5. Because you have games like Returnal and some other stuff coming from second party, but it's just different. We want to know the Ratchet style, God of War style, um, Last of Us style games that are going to come only to PS5. And even though Jim Ryan said he's not got nothing to say about that today, he he answered the question because otherwise it would have been a huge dunk to say like, yeah, we got Forbidden West for PS4 and I'm pleased to announce God of War Ragnarok will be only on PS5. So they they answered that question. And when they'll actually admit it remains to be seen. And we're obviously not going to get that game this year <laughs> yeah. or next year, I should say. Yeah, we're no. definitely not getting it this year, obviously. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about this some more. Number five. In safer times, there are an endless variety of conferences around the world where executives talk to curious audiences. And then and, and in the covid era, they're now happening online. At the Jefferies Interactive Entertainment Virtual Conference, as transcribed by website Seeking Alpha, Tim Stewart, who is the chief financial officer of Microsoft's Xbox division, was yet again asked about Microsoft's strategy in regard to its splashy acquisition of ZeniMax Media and therefore Bethesda. And he actually gave us the most clarity yet, clarity that indicates a cross-platform future for the brand. Colin was right. He said in part, quote, I'll say it from a cross-platform perspective. Microsoft is a platform. We're one of the first and really to really support Minecraft. Roblox, Fortnite across platforms. And by the way, the uh, transcription said roadblocks. Oh, my God. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. So we highly encourage cross-platform play simply from this landscape of if it's good for the gaming ecosystem, it's good for us. A classic rising tide lifts all boats. What we'll do in the long run is we don't have intentions of just pulling all Bethesda content out of Sony or Nintendo or otherwise. But what we want is we want that content in the long run to be either first or better or best or pick your differentiated experience on our platforms. We will want Bethesda content to show up on our pl- uh, best on our platforms, Ellipsis. I'm not announcing pulling content from platforms one way or the other, but I suspect you'll continue to see a shift towards a first or better or best approach on our platforms, end quote. Adam Thum wrote into us and said, hey, CCD, I'm starting to get burned out by the constant miss and mixed information from executives of gaming companies. From Xbox, Bethesda, will they, won't they be exclusive to Jim Ryan's We Believe in Generations lie to many other top brass. It's starting to become a drag. How can PR not have a single unified message to any of their top brass to stop with the messaging fuck ups? At this point, I feel like I'm just getting jaded with the clickbait articles and fanboy nonsense and wanted to know how you all feel about it. Hmm. So, Chris, this this new comment from Tim Stewart, I think, is a clear answer. I think anyone who's reading this otherwise is now continuing to lie to themselves about what Microsoft's going to do with Bethesda. But I think Adam's right from a PR perspective when they're letting their people talk at all of these different things and they're inevitably going to be asked about these major splashy deals. This isn't some Saber Interactive level deal. This is a deal more than twice as lucrative as Star Wars when Disney bought it. Right. So it's a big deal. And people are going to ask, especially the CFO uh, for Microsoft about it. But all PR really had to do is 
tell their people like when you're asked about Bethesda, just say the deal's not done yet and we have nothing to say at this time. Instead, they just keep talking. And I think that in terms of Mr. Stewart here, I think once again, they said exactly what I said they were going to say all along, which yeah. is the games are coming to PlayStation. But what do you think about what uh, Tim Stewart here said? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think I think, you know, Microsoft in, in general for the last like several years have been kind of on this kick, this kick of just kind of supporting cross platform and, and just being like, I, I can't even tell how many times I've I've heard Phil Spencer go like, yeah, you know, we just want people playing games. You know, it doesn't really matter. Like they've literally said it doesn't matter where you play. We just want you to play them. You know what I mean? Like they, they've he, he's said this countless times. So like it doesn't surprise me that Microsoft is going in this like rising tide lifts all boats kind of approach where it's like, yeah, you know, I, I think yeah, I even I even said this on the show, like where I was like, yeah, I think probably they'll probably have like maybe maybe timed exclusivity or like maybe exclusive content or maybe like, I don't know, some some crazy like Series X patch that like does some crazy shit that's maybe not available on other platforms or whatever. But like you're going to see these games on other platforms. It's it's pretty obvious. I, I, I the only reason I think they're being cagey about it is because the deal's not done and because, you know, if they say anything, then they're then they're held to it. But I think this is pretty pretty in keeping with their messaging, or it or it has been for quite some time. But yeah, PR in general <laughs> throughout video games right now is like a total mess. I don't know if that has anything to do with communication being a little hard now or or what, but it's <laughs> it's really fucking weird the amount of mixed messaging. Yeah, I it's 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 obnoxious and. I can't help but feel like Microsoft has to be a more calculated company than this. And I feel like maybe what they're doing is just seeding expectations. I just I get frustrated when I because they've been saying this over and over again. And no matter what they've been saying, Xbox fans have been like, I remember we talked about it a month ago or so where this thing was going around and everyone's like, see, and I'm like, what are you talking about? They just said what I said, like people are not even reading the words that are like being said or yeah. or heard. Right. And. I think what CFO Tim Stewart here is saying is not only with Bethesda, but I'll just continue to say, like, I think you're going to see Xbox games come to PlayStation. Like, I think it's if it's not going to happen in the next few years, it will eventually happen. He basically says it. And I don't really I got to be honest, I don't give a shit one way or the other. It's not like I have a horse in this race. I don't care. I mean, there are a few Xbox games that I would like to play. I play them when I when they come out or I go play them on PC and. I don't really have a lot of love for Bethesda, to be honest. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. So I don't give a shit if these games come to PlayStation or not. But it's something worth talking about. And I think it's pretty clear what's happening here. I still think it's a very wise investment, shrewd investment for Microsoft. I will reiterate, I think they overpaid. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's probably what they had to do to make the sale happen. Like they, they probably weren't for sale at all until they offered a ridiculous price and they got them. Yeah. But you're not going to make $7 billion back by selling your games on Xbox. I don't care what anyone says. Game Pass isn't even profitable. I don't know how this is going to work. So uh, shrewd move, but represents what I think, Chris, is a different. And like you said, and we've said many times, a different future for Microsoft. All right. This next one, Chris, is a long one. So bear with me. OK. <laughs> Number six. Oh, but boy. we got to get this all out into the open. The Embracer Group, the European corporation that owns THQ Nordic, Coke Media and other entities, has claimed a staggering 13 new studios absorbing the operations and IP of all 13. The substantial deal was broken down by website gamesindustry.biz, which notes that Embracer has actually funneled the 13 studio acquisitions through four different umbrellas, including itself. So this is a really complicated thing. This is why they broke it down. Embracer Group itself acquired Swedish studio Coffee Stain North, which had already owned a majority stake in. These are the guys or I'm sorry. These guys are a small PC centric studio with some mobile and console experience and have acted more like an indie publisher in recent years. Embracer likewise acquired Quantic Lab, a Romanian studio that it owned a minority stake in. Quantic Lab doesn't make its own games, but instead acts as a QA specialist, which Embracer is no doubt happy to have on board. Finally, Embracer itself nabbed Snapshot Games, the Bulgarian team that have quietly released two tactical RPGs in the past five years, one of which, Phoenix Point, is on PS4, came out in 2019. Through THQ Nordic, Embracer funneled its acquisition of Purple Lamp Studios, which work out of Austria. This deal makes sense. THQ Nordic and Purple Lamp Studios collaborated on SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, which Purple Lamp developed. And the team also has some porting experience, having brought Rare's Sea of Thieves to PC. Through its Coke Media Empire, Embracer acquired Flying Wild Hog, the Polish team you'd know best for its Shadow Warrior trilogy of FPSs, the third game from which launches in 2021, though only on PC. Embracer also funneled some sales through even smaller entities, 
Through Amplifier Game Invest, Embracer acquired Silent Games, a British team yet to put out its first game. While through Deca Games, Embracer grabbed Canadian free-to-play specialists A Thinking Ape and Canadian mobile devs Ayugo Mobile Entertainment, neither of which will have anything to do with us here on Sacred Symbols. And then Embracer sent its final five acquisitions through Saber Interactive, which itself was acquired by Embracer earlier this year. Italian studio 34 Big Things and Serbian team Madhead Games are two of the five under Saber. Argentinian free-to-play MMO specialist Nimble Giant Entertainment and Hungarian team Zen Studios of Zen Pinball fame are the third and fourth acquisitions. The fifth and final acquisition under Saber and the 13th overall isn't really a studio, however. Instead, Saber acquired Sandbox Strategies, the New York City-based PR firm that has long worked on third-party and indie games and will now act as an internal PR team for Embracer. All of these acquisitions come on the back of strong financial results for Embracer, with net sales up 85% year over year. And in those reports, they are open about acquiring more teams. They write in part, quote, the M&A market, that is um, mergers and acquisitions, is more active than ever. And in the past three months, we have been actively engaging with more than 100 entrepreneurs who want to be part of the Embracer family, including a dozen sizable businesses that have the potential to create new operative groups under the parent company, end quote. So the long and short of this is that Embracer has expanded by 13 studios. Jesus. But they've also made 85% more money this year than last year. So it's working, whatever they're doing. And then how it's all funneled into the different things. I'm really fascinated by this deal. I read a lot about this deal, Chris, because they bought, they bought, remember how, again, I hate to beat this dead horse, but I talked about how shrewd it was that they bought Saber Interactive because Saber Interactive is a porthouse. Yeah. Now they bought a QA team. That only does QA, which is awesome. Um, that's Quantic Lab. And then they bought a PR studio, a PR team in um, in the very well-known Sandbox Strategies, which I worked with a million times when I was at IGN. So they are buying not only teams, technically 11 teams, a QA studio and a PR agency. So they're really. Um, they're about to go all in. Yeah, they're really they're really positioning themselves, huh? Yeah, I, I, I'd say so. Uh, nothing too notable as far. I mean, I think what would you say? Zen Studios is probably the best known team here. Yeah, probably. That they bought. So nothing crazy. But yeah, I, I like how they funneled it through all of their different teams, too. So it's getting really quite complicated. I mean, there are now scores of entities. <laughs> it seems really fucking it seems really convoluted. Do you how do you think it feels to be like the the probably like objectively the the most well-known or the, or the best studio in that in that deal? And then looking around <laughs> At like at like the co- at like the company you're keeping, and it's like, oh, well, hmm. yeah, it's it's not know. good. I mean, Zen is definitely the best of the of that group, I guess. But yeah, it is a little weird. I'm more fascinated, Chris, by this idea of a hundred so called a hundred entrepreneurs who they're talking to right now. So it's a hundred entities. And I'll tell if anyone from Embracer is listening now, hey, Lily Mo's for sale. I know what you guys are paying for these other studios. So if you want to come pay us ten or fifteen million dollars, by all means, <laughs> you know, you can have Twin Breaker. You can have Herboxia. We'll give you those IP. Oh, yeah. But the price is $15 million. Obviously. All right. Number seven. Troubles continue at publisher Ubisoft. According to reporting from website Kotaku, the publisher has opted to remove the head of its Ubisoft Singapore studio after a so-called leadership audit, in quotes, as conducted by external entities. The man's name is Hughes Ricor, and in an inter- internal email to Ubisoft employees, it's noted that the results of the aforementioned audit, quote, unquote, makes it impossible for him to continue in this position, end quote. Record has been one of the many executives at Ubisoft accused of sexual harassment and similar claims. Interestingly, Record won't be fired from Ubisoft, however. The publisher confirmed to Kotaku that while he'll be leaving his leadership position and the Singapore team entirely, he'll remain an employee. So what he did probably couldn't have been that bad, but who knows? Record joined Ubisoft in time for the launch of 2012's Assassin's Creed 3, which he was senior producer on. He worked in a production role on virtually every Assassin's Creed game between then and 2018's Odyssey. And before that, he was the producer at EA, primarily working on Need for Speed and FIFA. This news comes the same week that a totally unassociated event on the other side of the world also embroiled Ubisoft, this time in Montreal, where a phoned in hoax to local police caused the studio to be evacuated for a possible hostage situation. Did you see that as that was kind of happening a couple days ago? (laughs) I did. Very weird. Really bizarre. Yeah, very weird indeed. But I wanted to give a shout out to Kotaku for for the original reporting. I, I'm wondering what this Hughes record guy did, because they say, quote unquote, it makes it impossible for him to continue in this position, but he's still an employee. 
So he must have been on a power trip or something. Maybe it's not sexual. I'm not I don't know for sure, but maybe it's not sexual impropriety. Maybe he was just an asshole. Yeah, I mean, uh, that could, I don't, that, not, that, not that that's excusable, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's definitely less insane, you know, or, or, or less uh, serious than <laughs> sexual impropriety. But it's still it's still probably a situation where it's like, yeah, you know, you got a uh, prerequisite for having a job like this is probably, you know, not being a, a maniacal lunatic. Yeah, not being a, a shithead. Yeah. So goodbye to him, but not goodbye to you yet. Number eight, wrap up. Website Komatsu reports adventure game when the past was around is coming to PS4 in mid-December and puzzler Retro Machina will come to PS4 in early 2021. In reaction to an error on the PlayStation Store, developer Ember Lab confirmed that its PS4 and PS5 console exclusive game, Ken, a Bridge of Spirits, is coming to the console in early 2021. The error had it as Q4 2021. Developer Gearbox revealed that Borderlands 3's PS5 iteration can run at 60 frames 4K or sub 4K at 120 frames. There you go, Chris. Ah, beautiful. Ubisoft has likewise revealed that the PS5 iteration of the largely forgotten Ghost Recon Breakpoint can do 4K 30 or 1080 60. So that's weird. Well, that's a difference. <laughs> uh, the publisher also revealed its post-launch plans for Immortals Phoenix Rising, which will include a season pass and three content expansions. It likewise revealed that Assassin's Creed Valhalla has had the biggest Assassin's Creed launch in the franchise's 13 year history when measured by units sold. Persona fan site Persona Central reports that several Asian retailers have listed an English language version of the Omega Force developed Musou Persona 5 Scramble the Phantom Strikers with a possible release date on Western PS4s of February 23rd, 2021. The game came out last year in Japan. And finally, even after saying the game was a standalone product that wouldn't receive updates or DLC, publisher EA has revealed that its well-received game Star Wars Squadrons will get free content released through the end of the year, including new maps and ships. So it's a good kind of lie, I guess. Yeah, no, that's great. That's uh, that's good shit. I don't mind. I don't yeah. mind that. No, that's a good lie. That's a, a rare EA move. A rare good EA move. I feel like EA has honestly been doing better lately. They I definitely have. They definitely have for a while, I think. Yeah, for sure. All right. Chris, it's time for our intriguing games of the week. This is when we call out a game that's coming out or has just come out on PSN. Your game is Hide and Dance, which is coming <laughs> to PS4. So tell me about it. Yeah. So Hide and Dance looks like. Uh, I <laughs> so I'll, I'll read uh, I'll read the description because I, I don't know how else to explain this. Dance to the rhythm of the music hiding from your incoming parent. Press the buttons to the rhythm of the music. Dance and make combos. Be careful not to be spotted by your mom entering the room. So it's it's this dancing like rhythm game, but you also have to like make sure not to get caught. And it's just so stupid looking that I can't help but really adore it. Uh, it came out on Switch like uh, in October, but it, it came out yesterday, uh, November uh, November eighteenth on PS4, and it's uh, it's like five dollars, and it looks. The gameplay of it looks hilarious, like absurdist. Love it. I love it. This is the, this is what this intriguing games of the week is all about. And yeah. why I think it's a better a better thing here. Um, the game I wanted to call out here, Chris, is a game called Five Dates, which is a full motion video game from a developer called Good Gate Media, which I'm not familiar with. But the publisher is Wales Interactive and. People might know Wales Interactive. They've released a few games that you might have played. But remember that game that we talked about a few months ago, Gamer Girl? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, they're, they're the ones publishing that game. And they also published that game uh, Made of Skur, which I think they developed internally, which is actually pretty well received, I think. No. Like a horror game? Maybe not. I'm looking at the Metacritic, I guess. Actually, it's got a... Actually, Twin Breaker did better than Made of Skur. So, okay. Strike that. So... This game is just cute. I think it's it's a really clever... This, see, this is the kind of clever stuff that I want on PS4 and PS5. It's on PS4, but you can play it on PS5, obviously. It's uh, it's about a guy who basically like downloads a fictional dating app, and then he talks to the various girls, but the game takes place during COVID. So they're all trapped in their houses, and it's about how they're getting to know each other. But you like make choices with the different girls to see if like the relationships will continue or not. <laughs> um, and there's supposed to be like seven or eight hours of like actual recorded footage of all of the people, and depending on the choices you make. So... I'm not going to like go to, to bat and say this is going to be the best game ever, but it's I watched the trailer and I was like, this is a really cool and cute idea and probably would be fun to play with like a spouse. Yeah. Or a friend or whatever. Um, so it's a pretty slow week. And this is the one that that jumped out to me. Five dates, which came out November 17th. So it's out now. Uh, Good Gate Media and Wales Interactive. 
It's on PS4 and elsewhere. And uh, you should go check it out if you'd like. Well, look at that. All right, Chris. Let's get into the reader mail here. As tradition dictates, we end the show with six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience over on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins last stand. Sean Kelvey wrote into us, Chris, and he says, hey, Colin and co-host, any predictions for the Game Awards? Who wins Game of the Year? And will Sony show anything for what's in store in tw- for 2021? Maybe Horizon or God of War. What I wanted to do here off of Sean's inquiry, Chris, is just talk about some of these Game of the Year nominations. Mm-hmm, yeah, I have the screen up here on my computer from the Game Awards website. Yeah. So the game of the game. And by the way, we'll do our Game of the Year stuff on Sacred Symbols in uh, January. Yeah, yeah. We want to give ourselves time. There's it, no rush. It's an interesting list that's that's up here. Yeah. What do you think of it? Yeah, well, so what do, we, what do we got? We got Doom Eternal. Yeah, so Game of the Year is Doom Eternal, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Ghost of Tsushima, Hades, Animal Crossing, New Horizons, and The Last of Us Part Two. So pretty strong group of games. Very yeah. strong group of games. Yeah, I can't... Uh, I, I think the only one that I would be like... I don't know. like, just, I, I think just because Final Fantasy VII it has remake in the title makes it look weird in this list, but I, I totally get it, obviously, because it's like way... It's obviously like way more than a remake, I think. I think honestly, the word remake in the title kind of does it a disservice. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting, strong showcase of games. I I think all of these games have a pretty good shot at it. Uh, I I was really happy to see Hades there because I I adore Hades. Hades is like a, a really sleeper hit for me. Um, I, I was playing it like back when it was like first entered early access on the Epic Game Store. Uh, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's on PlayStation yet. Is it? Hades PlayStation. No, no, Hades is not on PlayStation yet. No, I imagine it will be though at some point. Yeah, because definitely. I think they made a deal yeah. um for some timed exclusivity, but But Hades is is damn good, so I'm really happy to see that, especially just cuz Supergiant makes good shit. But all these other ones I think have a, a pretty a pretty fair shot as well. I th- Animal Crossing is is one that I just don't understand, <laughs> but like it obviously is a cultural phenomenon. I think I think Animal Crossing has a pretty strong chance of getting it, honestly. It might. I I was a I was a voter on the this once. Uh, or for a little while, uh, I had a vote in this because um, I think the audience votes, too. But like there's a panel of people that vote. And I think I voted for like three years or whatever. And um, it really is a popularity contest. I don't think because game of the year doesn't really even mean anything. It's like, what does that mean? Is it a, is a subjective? Is it, I think it is. But is, could it be an objective thing? It's totally. Subjective. I don't really know. You know, because like a game of the year could be like you could have a game of the year as far as like narrative or like a game of the year as far as like. Like if this was like a pure gameplay thing, like I'd be like, "Yo, Doom Eternal wins," you know. Like it's, it's not even a, it's not even a contest. Doom Eternal is like one of the most satisfying g- games I've ever played. It's like so impeccably designed from a combat perspective. It's perfect. But um, you know, like if if we're talking narrative, like that completely sh- that com- completely shifts it. You know, so it, it is kind of arbitrary in general. Um, what do you think is going to take it? Like a prediction for for the VGAs, not ours. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Animal Crossing is going to win. Yeah. Just knowing the people, the type of people that vote on this, I, I just think that that's going to win. But I would personally pick The Last of Us out of this group. It's worth noting Sony has two of these six games as internal exclusives and a third game, Final Fantasy VII Remake, is exclusive to their console for now. So yeah. huge win for PS4 as well. I was seeing that they they basically tripled or quadrupled like everyone else in terms of nominations, but they really only come through two games. So I think the most likely win here is probably like I, either Animal Crossing or The Last of Us. I think those two are the ones that probably have it. of Of this list, can you guess what I would pick? Out of I, I, you would pick Doom. I would pick Ghost of Tsushima. Oh wow, I, interesting. I think I might because Doom is brilliant wow. gameplay wise. I think I think it really is like a, a an impeccable thing. But the story is like so dumb, and and I, I couldn't care less about it. <laughs> Not that it matters because it's it's you know you could just skip it or just ignore it, but like I think sure. that does weaken the game overall. It's like the the focus on story where Doom twenty sixteen was a lot more like hey you know it's in the background whatever ignore it just go kill demons. But I don't know man ghosts just just from like a from a premise of like hey this is like what Assassin's Creed was supposed to be and it's like actually good this time and you know the way the way it uses the world to guide you around and like the story being really really pretty solid and the open world being fun to explore and shit. I, I really, uh, I really appreciated the efforts of, of Ghost of Shit. And now, now that it runs at 60 frames on, on PS5, holy shit. Like, God damn, that's nice. 
but uh, this is going to be yeah, this is going to be a tough one for people to figure out. We're going to have a probably pretty similar list. I mean, Hades and Animal Crossing won't be on our for games for us to consider. But yeah, these other four games will definitely be in the mix. And we have a few others in here as well. If you scroll down like 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim um, from Vanillaware is in Best Narrative, which is an interesting selection. If you're an Xbox fan, Ori is nominated for a few different things. But you see a lot of the same stuff. Half-Life Alex over and over again. You see Doom Eternal over and over again. Half-Life Alex not being a Game of the Year nominee is kind of a, kind of a snub, honestly. Yeah, it's surprising. It's surprising. I think, uh, I think that's kind of fucked up. Uh, you know, I, I would honestly put that... Like, I would put... I. I would put like Half Life Alex in in the place of Doom Eternal, honestly. Like, and I, I love Doom Eternal, but like, come on, dude. They have best ongoing here as well, Chris. And Destiny Two is one of them. I can't imagine that it wouldn't win because it's going against Apex Legends, Warzone, Fortnite, and No Man's Sky. Seems like Destiny Two is the clear winner there. Yeah, well, actually, No Man's Sky might. I, I think Destiny and No Man's Sky are definitely the two that probably have it. It's definitely between those two. Apex Legends is also like pretty well received and really good. Um, that's that's actually just straight up a good game also. But yeah, no, I, I would I would I would bet on Destiny 2 personally. Yeah, Destiny 2 is also nominated for best community support, which is actually kind of a cool award. It says recognizing a game for outstanding community support, transparency and responsiveness, including inclusive of social media activity and game updates and patches. It's kind of a cool idea, actually. Yeah, no, um, that, that's wonderful. And off the beaten path or two off the beaten path nominations for Sony is in best VR and AR. Dreams was nominated here for Media Molecule and Iron Man. Yeah, uh, from uh, No way, Half Life Alex doesn't have this though. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that they won't <laughs> like, win. That's, that's uh, hilarious. Uh, you know, but and then there's all these genre ones. Oh, I mean, innovation! You, you guys, and, innovation and accessibility is pretty good. Yeah, that's a yeah innovate. Yeah, there's a I like these different ones. The, the um some of these more off the beaten path. Yeah, nominations that are that are not genre. Uh, exclusive right because Watch Dogs is on here for the inex- accessibility. We talked a lot about The Last of Us Part 2. I couldn't believe all the work that must have gone into that. And uh, Sony certainly at the forefront of that. Yeah, the, access- the accessibility, they-, they got that. Best action, obviously Doom Eternal. Yeah, no, this is a, I feel like this is going to be a fun one to watch. Uh, Best Family has a lot of good shit in it too. Best Family game is Animal Crossing, Crash Bandicoot 4, Fall, yeah, Fall, Fall Guys, Paper Mario, Minecraft Dungeons. That's surprising. Yeah, my yeah, that game just I was I'm curious. Minecraft Dungeons I don't think even really charted. I wonder how it did. It seems like it's so stupid, but it seems like Minecraft is like a a memory from another era. But obviously, it's played more than everything else. <laughs> yeah, I know. Best best sim and strategy has Gears Tactics in it, which makes me happy because that was that was some good shit. Yeah, yeah, Microsoft hadn't Microsoft has not really released or published much this year, so they they've not really had an opportunity to net you know X or for instance like Halo would have been like a big big get. Oh, yeah, no, uh, for well, them this year, oops. but I'll happen next year. So the game awards are on Thursday, December 10th. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about it, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's, we'll definitely talk about it in terms of um, what's announced. And that was what the question from Sean was. Will we see more? I think Sony usually does have something to say at the game awards. I I, I would hope that they don't announce another game. I, I would like more information about something that they've already released or already announced. Let's let's not get ahead of ourselves, get ahead of the skis here. Pair of shoes wrote into us, Chris. He says, hey, Colin, Chris, and maybe Dustin with a lot of Pierce getting a job with Sony Santa Monica. It brings to mind something I've thought about for a while. Isn't there a huge problem with people getting in the video games media posts just to try and get a job with a game company? I personally think this could be a big conflict of interest in games media and could lead to some very dishonest opinions just to gain favor with certain companies. What do you all think? Thanks for the great content each week. So Alana, I, I've met Alana once. She was nice to me. I, I don't know her, though. Chris knows her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's a very popular streamer and podcaster. She worked at IGN, but after I was there, so I, I didn't work with her. And she got a job as, I guess, like a junior writer or whatever on God of War Ragnarok, which is awesome uh, for her. So congratulations to her. Yeah. But this is a huge jump. And, and it does bring up this question of of where the delineation between the two sides exists. And I, I will say just at the top, I don't think people get because Parachute says, is it a huge problem? People getting into the video games media posts just to try and get a job with a game company. I don't think anyone does that. I think that like it's your foot in. And then when you have experience, then other opportunities become available to you. But I don't think it's necessarily one or the other. I didn't know anyone that worked at IGN that was like, I'm just here to try to get experience so I can go to Capcom or something. I I, I didn't know anyone like that. Yeah. People do that. But 
I didn't know anyone about that. What do you think about this? Do you think it's a problem? People jumping back and forth between the sides? Well, I, I mean, I, I should say that like Alana and I are, are friends. Obviously, like we've we've you know, we play video games and shit. So like, I, I don't know if my opinion really it's obviously going to be colored in that way. But, you know, in in my experience, I just feel like, um, you know, Alana's one of those people like sh- she's very experienced. She she actually has like um, as far as I know, like she's actually trained in like actual journalism, like she actually did study it like properly. She did a good job. She's never really been dishonest. Uh, she works really hard. And I think uh, she's always wanted to be a writer. I think she's always said that it's been pretty transparent. So the fact that she got this job is just like, you know, I, I think she would have taken a job writing at any great, you know, studio or, or any great film studio or any any great production house that would have been a good fit for her talents. And I think, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I, I, I'm sure some people go into the industry looking for that kind of thing, but I, I don't know if, you know, I, I don't know if I would say that it's like a an inherently bad thing considering, you know, we, we all kind of exist in this kind of enthusiast press anyway. Like we have, like I would, if, if, yo, if, if, <laughs> if Bungie was like, yo, write for us, I, w- I would take that job immediately. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I would, would jump, I would jump into Bungie this, the, for, for no money. <laughs> so, you know, I, wow. I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I should I think start lowering your pay a little bit. Uh, well, well let's not too get much. too carried away there. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't even know if I could really talk about this because I, I feel uh, so in, in intrinsically entwined in this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I wanted to just acknowledge. It. I mean, it's a big hiring. Alana is obviously a big member of of Games Media, and um, I think it's a really good uh, it's a really good fit for someone that has the chops to do it. She's not going to go in and write the game. I mean, she's she's going to probably write menus and and add to the lore and all that. And that's how you get started. And and that's where the experience, I think, begins. And and hey, we were just talking about Hades, which comes from a, a studio in San Francisco called uh, Supergiant. That was co-founded by the old editor in chief of GameSpot, who wrote who writes all those games. So it, sometimes you want that kind of jump to happen. I mean, look at Gary Witta. Gary Witta used to write for like PC Gamer and shit. And then he wrote wrote fucking Rogue One. You know, so yeah, these, and these things ha- these things happen. Yeah, and, and I would like to also just say that, generally speaking, the people who who make those jumps are typically the people who just know their shit. You know, it, it's never like some junior, like it's never some like guy who's just like, yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna su- suck everybody off and just give everybody nines out of tens and like, and then I'll end up you know writing for you know The Last of Us Part Three or whatever. It's it's usually like people who are genuinely hardworking and genuinely good at their shit. Uh, who have something to offer the studios that they go to. It's it's in in my experience in, in the in the jumps that I have seen. Yeah, I'm I'm totally with you. I, I absolutely agree. People usually migrate over and become producers first and then they work up um, from there. My, my old friend at one up and I Tina Sanchez, uh, I don't know where she is now. She actually might be at Sony Santa Monica, too. But she worked at Respawn for a long time and as others, you know, she was a writer and all that. And then she went over and and started doing production work. And you see that a lot. There are a lot of people that have made that jump. So don't be too distressed. It's kind of the natural evolution. I I have to say, Pair of Shoes, that unless you find yourself in a situation like me and Chris or others where we have our own command of an audience outside of a big brand and we make good money and it's lucrative for us. There's all a ceiling you hit in games media pretty quickly. And if you want to if you want to like own a house or like have a family or make money, you got to go to the game devs because they're the ones that pay. I mean, you're not going to make you're not going to make I mean, you're not going to make more money. I, the, the second I left IGN, I started making more money. It kind of funny. It was like not even. You know, it, it, and I was like one of the highest ranked people there. So you can only imagine that yeah. if you're an associate editor, like Chris said. You know, you got to learn, you keep your head down and you figure things out. But eventually you need to get a, a like a better job. You're not going to you're not going to survive on sixty thousand dollars a year for the rest of your life in San, San Francisco if you want to own something and yeah, and all that. All right. Let's see here. Dominic Brandt wrote into us, Chris. He says, hey, boyos, what do you think of the trope of mashing a button really fast as a sort of quick time event? Personally, I found it to become stale and overused, not to mention it can be kind of hard for people with accessibility needs to tap something repeatedly. I really appreciate that some games like Uncharted, Spider-Man and The Last of Us have a setting to let you circumvent those moments by holding down the button instead. Hmm, Dominic, I wonder what the collective connection between those games are. Have a good one. Well, they're all published by Sony, of course. It's funny because in Miles Morales, I was kind of thinking about this recently. You know, you do the crime crime chase thing and you one of them is like you get the car and then you have to stop it from moving and you hit the triangle button and the square button. 
it is a little trite, but I just don't know what else you're supposed to do. And the only other thing I can think of for me is like, oh, so you don't do anything. It kind of goes back to the boy, the, the boss fight philo- philosophical argument we have where it's like, I don't really need a boss fight. Do you replace it with just a cut scene? I'm like, yeah, you kind of do. So do you replace like the quick time events with just watching? Is that satisfactory to people? It, it's just like 15 years ago, we were like all about quick time events with God of War and everything. And they quickly, because <laughs> yeah, it was a really yeah. clever way to kind of circumvent these cinematics that you didn't do anything in. But now it's, um, I do agree that it's a little trite. What do you think? It, yeah, it is a little, I'm not a big fan of, I'm not a big fan of quick time events in general. Like, I, I think they have their place. I think Resident Evil 4 is like quick time events central, but like it kind of works because it's, it's kind of baked into that game's charm. And like you said, with God of War and, 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 and other other games of the sort, I, I just think it gets to a point where it's like, OK, well, we've we've done this a million times. There's got to be there's got to be better ways of uh, of doing things like this. And, and I, I, I get that, you know, having a button on screen makes it feel like you're not just watching a cutscene, but you, you basically are still, you know, <laughs> you're basically still just watching Spider-Man do this thing. Because you're not, it doesn't really require any other input other than just like pressing square a bunch. And part of me feels like there's like a placebo to it. You know what I mean? Uh, there's got to be. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like, oh yeah, I'm watching it. I'm watching a cutscene, but I'm going to have button prompts in front of it to make it feel, to make the player feel like they're doing something when they're actually kind of not. There's a bunch of games like, what are those games like? Oh my God. I can't remember the names of them specifically. And it wasn't even necessarily like a series. It's just a bunch of games that I remember where you could fail a quick time event and it just straight up wouldn't matter. <laughs> you know, like yeah, well, just, that was like that was like every Quantic Dream game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, what's the point then? I don't know. I, I think it is trite and dumb. And I don't know. I, I, the less quick time events that are in a game, the more I'll like it. Honestly, it's funny because I think um, we just need another clever designer to come through and figure out a, a solution because quick time events were at one. It's funny because QTE seems so old but at one point it was actually quite novel and engaging in the ps2 era and into the ps3 era so it's been a while but it's funny how one at one time a solution comes up along in which case it's no longer a solution and it becomes a problem and then you need some other clever designer to come in and say like this is how you will now interact with your game so we wait patiently i am not that designer it's, it's just funny so. how often we just find new ways to press down the same button you know like i, I know like in uh in a lot of games now there's the hold you, you know, you you hold the button to right, right. to do something that is essentially just pressing it, <laughs> and it's like okay, I guess. Yeah, it's. I don't know. We'll see. I, I guess some people, you know, so sometimes you don't want to break things that aren't or fix things that aren't broken. But it would be nice to have some new interface options that don't seem so old and tired. But again, I just don't know what the answer is. And I don't know what people want because I think what I want in my games is, is often very different than what people want in theirs. Judah Bailey wrote into us and said, greetings, Colin and Chris. Why is Sony sitting on a gold mine of older titles that haven't been released since the PS3 and Vita versions? We have infamous sly resistance in the older God of War games, just to name a few. Does Sony not like easy money? Do you think we can expect these older titles to get ported and remastered over the course of the generation? Or is Sony just going to leave these games to die on older hardware? Curious to see what you all think and keep making podcasts great. So there are a lot of dormant franchises. You and I talk about resistance all the time, but Judah's right, Chris. I mean, there are series even like the the first two God of War games and the first two infamous games and, and the three resistance games, like we said, and Sly one, two and three that and Sly four, actually, that we cannot even play on PS4. And I'm kind of, it's funny that Judah wrote in about this because I was thinking about it a couple of days ago in the shower. I'm like. Could they could Sony like get some retro kind of service going that is integrated in the PSN where you just buy games? It's it's not anything different. It's just a different vertical in which you buy games and they can kind of meter these releases and these re-releases out over months and years so that we get something new every few months. I think that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. You don't have to go back to the PS1 era, but yeah, there are a lot of PS2 to PS3 remasters that are stranded and it's and it is a problem. Well, I I think they definitely should go back to the PS1 era. But uh yeah, I think the way I honestly think the way that Nintendo does it is 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 pretty pretty smart. The way they have their virtual console set up where it's like, you know, it's a different not necessarily in the in the way that it shows up on the cross media bar or, or the main menu because there's like a different app that launches per console and I don't necessarily think it it needs to be that 
But the way that they do it is, you know, every, I think, year or every few months, they'll add new games from this classic console into this kind of dedicated storefront or dedicated app. And, and you don't even have to pay. It, it comes with, you know, the the Nintendo online service and you just get access to all these old games. Like I was, I was playing Donkey Kong Country because it just came out on the SNES vertical and it was just like, this is so cool. I, I love this. Like th- that it's just like, I, and I wonder what's going to come out like in a couple months from now or what's going to be out next year. I wonder if there's going to be an N64 virtual console that's going to come out with like a bunch of N64 stuff. And, you know, uh, I, I think it would be wise of Sony to look into something like that where, because that's something that I think they can offer that Xbox kind of can't. Granted, Xbox obviously, you know, just lets you buy straight up and and download old titles like just uh, as a part of backwards compatibility which is also pretty nice but it doesn't have that you know metered release that kind of keeps people invested and keeps people excited and quite frankly they also just don't have the the breadth of a library that sony does and they could really they could really capitalize on that on that heritage by doing something like that i think i think it's a super wise idea yeah, it would be. I agree. I agree with everything you said. I think it would be cool for them to figure this out. I assume that it's something that they are thinking about. I don't think it's going to come through natural PS3 backwards compatibility. So they're going to need to figure out a way to port these games. And maybe it'll be, a you know, it would be a pretty neat thing to kind of include in PlayStation. If it's not in PS now, then even PS Plus, where it's like you get a free retro game because everyone was wondering, like, what do you replace the PS3 and PS4 games and PS Vita games with? Eventually, we used to get like six games a month. Remember? Yeah, now we get like two and people are like, well, what do we, do we get a PSVR game or whatever? Maybe it could be a retro game, like a retro first party or second party game every month. Can't be a PSVR game because there aren't enough. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, but that's true. But yeah, no, I think a, like a, a retro game a, a month would be would be sick, even if it was something absurd. You know, just the fact that you were getting something that like if you got if you got like, uh, I don't know, uh, Middle Earth Shadow of, uh, you know, Shadow of War on PS4 and then you got. You know, some other game on PS4, like, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, Octodad or whatever. It's like, oh, that's pretty old, whatever. But then you get, like, here's a Croc 2. <laughs> Just something, like, even if it's, like, weird and kind of, like, out there, the, fa- the fact that it's so old is kind of in and of itself interesting enough to be like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grab that and see what the fuck that sure. is. You know, even sure. if you're not interested in it, just claiming it just broadens your library, and it, it, that's cool. I, I think people people like that. I think. Yes. All right. There's two more here. Robbie Bra wrote in and said, question for CNC. After hearing all the hype about the dual sense and having received my PS5 after a few days of playing with my Series X, I was excited to finally test out the haptic feedback in the controller and its triggers. While I would say I'm impressed overall and love the technology, I feel like some areas of praise may be exaggerated. Example, quote unquote, feeling the sand or ice in Astro. Let's be honest. That doesn't provide any sort of indication that it's a feeling unique to sand. If anything, I was just feeling vibrations of the noise, the depressed sand motion was making, the crunch. Having said this, I'd like to hear your impressions now being one week removed from that initial feeling and response. Do you still feel just as amazed or or are you like me impressed but still feeling that this is familiar territory and not quite new frontier tech in our hands? After all, it is essentially just iPhone, MacBook Pro haptic tech, but just in a game controller. I don't know enough about enough about the, the technology to know the nature of it, but I still find it very impressive. And to what Chris had said a while ago, for me, I feel like it's um, it's it, it, even though it's in an iPhone, I have an iPhone and I have all this stuff. It, it's new to me. It feels new to me and it, it feels like it's something I've never felt before. So I am still quite excited about it. And um, yeah, I'm wondering if you feel any different about it a week removed or so. I, I mean, I'm a little less enamored with it, but like it, it is like it is impressive. It's still cool. Uh, I, I agree that I think the haptics were overpraised, but I think the triggers are really cool. Genuinely, you know, like because I remember walking through Astro's playroom and being like, oh, yeah, it's cool that you could feel like the differences between textures and it's like oh yeah sand does feel differently than snow and it, it is really cool I, I just am painfully self-aware and I just know that this technology just isn't going to be utilized by the overwhelming majority of uh, games that come out on the on the platform e- even first party I, I don't imagine is going to utilize it too much as the, as the years go on because I, I feel like it's probably a huge pain in the ass to program different types of vibrations in a in a haptic controller that is only that is only going to be like 
usable on one platform out of the what uh you know xbox xbox series x ps4 pc you know putting all that dev time into into a feature for one platform is is just kind of i just know based on history that it's probably going to fall by the wayside eventually but you know the triggers are still impressive to me i really like the the way that they can adapt resistance uh i think it's bitten some games in the ass i I think godfall is is made infinitely worse by its poor use of it but I, i do think the technology is really cool it's impressive to me still even if it is ultimately probably going to end up the way of you know six axis hd rumble over the course of time like for right now it is impressive and i i'm happy with that although i did see something earlier today on twitter a twitter a friend of mine friend of mine he's australian games reviewer is skill up i'm sure some people have seen his yeah stuff. i know him yeah, yeah he tweeted earlier today he says so my dual sense is broken Looks like the adaptive trigger over-adapted. Now R2 has lost most of its tension. The result is that it's ridiculously sensitive to the point where if I so much as breathe on it, it comes to a full press. Oh, the wow. irony is not lost on me, which which makes sense. You know, this is kind of the danger of, of making new technology with more mm-hmm. moving parts. Uh, this is definitely a controller that you're not going to want to drop ever. Uh, I can feel yeah. that. You, 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 you feel that too, right? Definitely. Yeah, it feels like a real electronic. Yeah, like it's some, something delicate. Yeah, it feels like something that you're definitely going to want to keep really safe, because if you drop this thing, you know, there's enough there's enough moving parts in this thing that like any it, it feels like it could easily get thrown out of whack, whereas opposed to like, you know, an Xbox one controller or a PS4 controller is just like, you know, it's the buttons, the, the rumbles and the and the sticks. It's a lot more sturdy in its cheapness in that in that way. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I think it's 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 still an impressive controller, regardless of whether or not I feel it's going to be utilized to its fullest potential in the years to come. I agree. I think that I need more experience with it to know the the full run of what we can do with it. But just playing Astro Bot or Astro's Playroom and then playing Spider Man Miles Morales, I, I'm impressed so far. I love it. Yeah, it bothers me though because like I'm, I'm I don't want to get the new Call of Duty, but I I've heard that the guns in it you are, make really good use of the adaptive triggers and it's like god damn it i i need i need another experience to really prove to me you know what i mean like his astros right. is so good but i i need that i think i need that triple a so i might just i might just bite the bullet and get get call of duty just to just to see i've heard the same thing about cold war that it's it's pretty remarkable so yeah you'll let us know when the time comes i'll play it at some point but not anytime soon Final inquiry is an easy one to answer. I think comes from Claire McMaster, who says, hello, CNC and listening to all three of your first impressions or reviews. And he's talking to Dustin, too, of PS5. One thing I don't think any of you gentlemen have mentioned as far as the new UI is concerned is the fact that there's no more folders or dynamic themes, both of which I absolutely loved on PS4. I realize now that dynamic themes might be a thing of the past, just given how PS5 automatically changes the background to match whatever game or app you're currently highlighting, whereas on PS4, They worked because you had to press down on the D-pad or left stick to pop up the game hub. But folders were one of the best things about the PS4 UI and one of the main reasons it blows away that dog's breakfast of a UI on Xbox One and now Series X and S. Anyway, what are your thoughts on this? So Claire wants to know, Chris, what our thoughts are on the missing folders and dynamic themes. For me, the di- I never give a shit about themes. I tried. I really just like the standard backgrounds on things, even on laptops and stuff. I just don't need to personalize it that much and folders people used to bust balls all the time because I didn't use folders I just like let everything go on my cross media bar so I didn't use either of these features so they're totally lost on me and my assumption is is that Sony was comfortable getting rid of both because their data shows that few people were using them on their end too especially with dynamic themes because dynamic themes were paid for mostly so sometimes they were free but you could pay for them and that's money that's revenue that they just decided not to even carry over so clearly a lot of people weren't using them and clearly, a lot of people weren't using folders either. What do you think? Yeah, I, I never use folders. In fact, I, I used folders once, and I immediately hated the way they looked, so I undid it. I never liked them. They're, they're unimpressive to me. So I, so the, the loss of them, I didn't even notice. But, yeah, you know, the, the loss of... Um, I like themes. I like being able to personalize things. I, I don't necessarily have to, but it is a nice kind of option to have. And the loss of it in PS5 is kind of annoying especially just because like i would like to at least be able to change the color of the you know the settings menu that's like that kind of gold that kind of beige kind of tint that they have at the very least like let me do something like that uh maybe you can and i just haven't found it in this fucking labyrinthian (laughs) 
disaster of a, of a user interface in some cases. But I, I don't know if I, I, I necessarily miss them. I, I think I've gotten used to the idea of like, you know, dynamic themes in the sense of like, oh, hey, you know, the, the background changes because on Xbox, that's how that works, too. Like if you highlight Doom Eternal, the background will be, you know, the Doom Eternal uh, like Doom Eternal themed, or if you highlight Halo, it'll be Halo themed, and like all that stuff. So I'm I'm just kind of used to that. So going to the PS5 was was kind of a natural evolution of that, and I didn't really mind it. But folders, I I, I yeah I I never loved or liked folders at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't miss these things, Claire. But I'm sorry that you do. And again, I w- I would assume that the data indicates that they removed it because they didn't need need them anymore because people weren't using them. All right, Chris. That's all we have for this episode of Sacred Symbols. Well, well, well. Appreciate your time today. Well, as thank always. you, my guy. And thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of our show on Patreon and on free feeds. It's very much uh, good to have you here as we near the end of the year and everyone starts getting their PS5s and we start playing and doing all of our things. Very fun. Very exciting. We have more to say, but we'll leave it for the next episode. Until then, thank you for your time. Love. All of the rest. Goodbye. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product of and a registered trademark of Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Richmond, Virginia and Burbank, California, USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Raygun. You can find me on Twitter at No Taxation and on Instagram at CLS Moriarty. Chris is on Twitter at Chris R. Gunn and on Instagram at Chris underscore Ray underscore Gunn. Sacred Symbols is edited by Dustin Furman. To message the show online, please use Patreon's DM service. As you know, all of Colin's Last Stand shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and we are eternally grateful for your kindness, generosity, and fandom. Nick DeMarco, Constantine Valencia, Andrew Morgan, Gregory Slavinsky, Stephen Nieder, Ross Marenka, Zach Parsley, Miguel A. Brewer, Morgan Ashley, Ben, Azan, Michael Vecchio, Brianne, Joey Finelli, Jerome Ferreira, SL the FMA, Ryan T. Mandel, Jorge Palomino, Enrique Perez, Don Lee, Daniel Diamore, Brad Cooley, Jeremy Key, Patrick Leslie, Homeworld Hub, William Holbert, 3DPrintShop.com, Chris Buston, Betty Ann Moriarty, Colin Jewell, Nelson LeBlanc, Daniel Johnson, Zach Bonham, an unofficial controller podcast, Jay Getter, Vexius, Jeff Mercado, Galja, Fortuna, Boots, Megadet, Saul Balcazar, Raul Melendez, Bloody Fang, Eric Harden, Matt Martin, Rodney Coleman, Chris Moore, TB Lightning, Andy Kinnanen, Taylor Barkley, Chris Galvin, Ryan Murdoch, Mason Cadillac, Ollie Fritz, Chris Buston, Zach Allum, George Anthony Nunez, Kyle Hagel, Colin Love, Daryl E. Naiman, Ryan R. Kittredge, Toby Ryland, Michael S., Damon Weathers, Carl Tolman, Richter86, Barrett Boswell, Christopher DeVaio, Kevin Kamaki, Blake Israel, Sean Mason, Josh Gravelick, Brian Chan, Organic Produce, Ali C83, Isaac Watson, Ostman, Mubarak, Carlos Algaret, McDog18, Richard Hebert III, Miranda Grubba, Ray Lasia, David Castanez, Donnie Nolan, Josh Yeager, Matthew Cooper, Toothless Gibbon, Martin Beck, Gavin, Joey Andrzejczyk, Nathan R., Joe McPartland, Christopher Moore, Lawrence F. Prokop, Colin Davenport, Eric Finkenbeiner, Lou and Ray Loper, Dylan Burns, John Schultz, David Chestnut, Yusuf, Anton K., Alan Trembley, Tyler Bello, Tony Zuniga, Sean Battershall, Robbie Hensley, Alex Cabrera, Lennon Brixey, Corey Wyatt, James Kinsler III, Hugo's Desk, Peter Reynolds, William O. Carroll, JSC0828, Jesper Jansen, Phil Crone, Throw7, Adam Nix, Josh McKinney, Michael Gates, Alex Gates, Sean Chandler, Petro Rose, Gio Corsi, Greg Lada, Gerald Pennington, Justin Wagaman, Paul Joyce, Chad Lewis, Todd Paxton, Joshua Smallwood, Shane Rayum, Spencer Brand, John Cordero, Greg Julefs, Mark Boggio, Keith 